Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Black Brain Trust. Today's Geopolitics, Episode 92. I'm here with my co-facilitator, I know. Hello. Hello, everyone. How you doing? Uh, how you doing today, Mike? I'm good, brother. Yourself? I'm all right. All right. So we'll get started with the um, with the Hangout. And if you want to follow along, we put a docket in the description uh, below the video. So, first article is from NewYorkTimes.com. Saudis close to Crown Prince discuss killing other enemies a year before Kasaji's death. I'll read the uh, first paragraph. Washington. Top Saudi intelligence officials close to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, also known as MBS, asked a small group of business businessmen last year about using private companies to assassinate Iranian enemies of the, of the kingdom. According to three people familiar with the discussions, the, the Saudis acquired, inquired at the, at a time when Prince Mohammed, uh, which is MBS, uh, then the deputy crown, crown prince and defense minister, was consolidating power and directing his adversaries, his advisors, to escalating to escalate military and intelligence operations outside the kingdom. Their discussions, more than a year before the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi indicated that top Saudi officials have considered assassination since the beginning of MBS's ascent. So what we're learning from this article um, is that this person, Mohammed bin Salman, the prince who is now looking to be king, uh, already had a game plan, already had a playbook set up for assassinations and, and power consolidation, as well as um, what to do about the Middle East as as a, as a foreign policy and as well as a national policy. Um, using businessmen to attack um, your enemies is uh, similar to having economic hitmen, basically like, uh, you know, George Soros or, or uh, the, 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 Co the Koch brothers or these other guys, you know, using, using their resources to, um, to get, get to your adversaries. And, what we're, what we're now starting to learn is that there's fragility, political fragility inside the House of um, Saud, and they cannot actually stabilize the country because, you know, there's so much dissenting uh, going on, you know, with all these princes and, you know, uh, kings and soon-to-be kings and, you know, soon-to-be princes. I think Saudi Arabia has something like 2,000 princes uh, or princes, uh, if, if I remember correctly. Um, it, it, whatever the number is, it's pretty high. Um, so you're going you're gonna to have competing bodies all over the place. and You're going to have uh, all types of corruption, um, you know, for power grabs. So it doesn't surprise me that um, this information is now, now starting to come out, that, you know, they had this all set up and, you know, um, wiretapping and using um, Israeli technology to actually track, um, you know, Kasaji in, in uh, Turkey, um, his whereabouts. Uh, from his Apple smartwatch to his iPhone and things of that nature. It, it, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I know, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, um, I read the article and I read everything that the article was um, insinuating or saying the information that, that, that they dug up and this article comes from the New York Times. So a lot of the information that they have is pretty much bank on it and everything you're saying putting those two things together yeah they are doing from a lack of a better term too much uh -huh. you know um wanting businessmen to kill people and you know that's to me that's too much um uh then the amount of people they want to kill. Uh, it's just what what they're doing. It's just uh, just like on, on one of the pre shows, you know, we talked about they killed another journalist, and they don't have any tact. Also, you know, you 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 you're in a spotlight for killing a Saudi journalist. 
on another country's soil, but then you turn around and just kill another journalist. People are going to pay attention to that. You know, your time is horrible. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in deep doodle. You know, I, I like still another like yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's important uh, for people who are listening to this to understand that uh, Kasaji was not a journalist. Um, he became a journalist, but he was not a journalist originally. He was actually uh, involved in a lot of um, central intelligence operations um, mm. within the kingdom. So, he, he journalist is just a title that they, they that they throw on him, but he was actually involved in a lot of um, clandestine operations inside Saudi Arabia and outside of the country as well, which is why he sought refuge over here. Um, in the United States, he got citizenship. So, um, what exactly he did, uh, I'm, I can't really speak to him because, um, because I don't know all the particular details behind it. But he was definitely a high-ranking, um, a high-ranking person himself uh, within the kingdom, as well as uh, working for Central Intelligence and Saudi Intelligence, uh, involved in, in uh, things in, in Africa and as well as the Middle East. So it sounds like he. Um, it sounds like he and his sons um, were, were next in line, you know, for for uh, power grabs. So, yeah, uh, I I'm trying to say a few things at once, but Saudi Arabia, um, their foundation is not as firm as it seems. There's a lot of cracks in it, like you said. There's a lot of competing bodies to be to wear the crown to to be have the title of the crown prince on top of that you have um wars in yemen that you're involved in your your ties with other people um they're yeah they're yeah they're in the situation yeah absolutely um and this is just the first this is just one of many uh, they last year they uh, arrested hundreds of princes and um, sheikhs and things of that nature um, within the kingdom, mm-hmm. putting them in uh, hotels, using hotels as uh, prison cells, and even uh, I think they even killed one in a helicopter. Um, basically, uh, he tried to get away in a helicopter, and a uh, Saudi Air Force came and shot his plane down. So, and and wasn't one of the uncles shaking down and he had to take his money taken away from him? They took money away from everybody. Took money away from everybody. So uh, your money is you can be used as influence, right? So if for mm-hmm. you know for these um, uh, for these clerks and uh, or these clerics and things like that, um, they can they can buy their way out of things, and that's pay, and that's pretty much what they did. Is they paid a ransom for their own for their own kidnapping. So. Or for for the for uh, MBS's uh, uh, kidnapping of them, right? So, mm-hmm. you imagine in the black community that would be the equivalent of arresting all the pastors and, and preachers in, in, in the uh, in the black churches and, and basically uh, shaking them now. Yeah, this yeah this uh, mm-hmm. MBS is he's doing a lot of things. He's still new to the crown. Same age as you. Yeah. yeah. He's a millennial, man. I, I, yeah. I mean, <laughs> just, just reading the article, you will say, what? Really? Mm-hmm. Having, I mean, I'm actually making deals with businessmen and then saying, hey, um, can you all kill this person? <laughs> no, no, we, no, we just gonna make business, and having hit on people, multiple contracts. Then you hear the um, the the, the middleman guy between uh, MPS and some um, people in Washington that he would um, lobby on MPS's behalf, and then MPS's general, close general, that took the fall for Kashagi's death. Um, um, them having conversations on who they should kill next or who's next in line to be assassinated. Goodness gracious, man! You know, and 
and I'm not, I'm not saying that to say no other country um, kill people, mm-hmm. but the level in which they're doing it, you know, it's you know Tuesday night assassination on Channel Five, mm-hmm. you know, it's crazy. Well, Keep in mind during slavery that that's exactly what they did to a lot of African slaves because uh, the, um, the, the Sauds, the uh, House of Saud or, or the Saudis were heavily invested into uh, butchering uh, African slaves. Mm-hmm. Making them um, Enochs. Right. Yeah. So they have a long tradition of doing stuff like that. Yeah. We'll so. This article. All right, this next article is from uh, Taz.com, which is a Russian uh, news site. Uh, Taliban ready to take part in next Moscow meeting in, uh, on Afghanistan diplomat. You can see the uh, Taliban and the, um, the rest of the leaders from Pakistan and Uzbekistan and uh, Turkmenistan and whatnot, uh, Russia as well, um, partaking in this. I'll read the first paragraph. The Taliban movement, terrorist, organi- terrorist organization outlawed in Russia, is ready to take part in the next round of Moscow con- consultations on Afghanistan. Russian Special President, Presidential Envoy for Afghanistan, Director of the foreign, Russian Foreign Ministry, Second Asian de- Department, Zemir Kublov, told has. That's a long title. It is. Yeah. Principally, the Taliban is ready, Kublov said. They like the idea very much. They are ready to take part. According to the diplomat, Moscow expects Kabul will send both the de- delegation of the Afghan High Peace Council and official government representative. This will this will make any inter-Afghan agreements more le- legitimate, Kabul said. The Afghan government demanded holding direct talks with the Taliban movement on the sidelines of the Moscow format uh, uh, consultations, but the Taliban refused, he said. So what we're seeing here is that um, the Taliban has become more politicized. Um, Mm -hmm. They are no longer guys with towels wrapped around their heads uh, fighting in the deserts. They're actually putting on suit and ties and and showing up in the... um, you know, showing up to uh, uh, conference rooms and having meetings now and dialogue about what they're going to do. Um, for those who don't know, the Taliban actually has almost two thirds of uh, control of the of the country itself. Yeah, this is amazing. I remember um, a few months back we spoke about um, when I first heard about the um, Taliban being more politicized. Um, it shocked me. But that's this is a good step for them, <laughs> you know. Um, grain of salt, um, you know. But yeah, this is a good step for them to be more politicized to continue their interests to further their interests and um, be um, become in power in the in in uh, Afghanistan. Yeah, and, and it's a high probability that um, if they were to have elections, snap elections, uh, some form of democracy, that the Taliban would actually regain power, would have power within um, within parliament, within Afghan parliament. And if the Taliban gains power, then what does that mean for the United States occupation inside Afghanistan? Mm. Yeah, they're... They're going to try to force them out. Well, Afghanistan, well, the Taliban is going to try to force American occupation out of Afghanistan. Right. You have Russia to the north that is saying, you know, we we want to be a part of the delegation and we'll host it for you. And then you have China partaking in it as a, a partner. Um, 
Pakistan is a partner. Iran is a partner. They share borders with it, um, with mm-hmm. Afghanistan. Um, and the other uh, uh, Eurasian countries as uh, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, they're, they're, all, they're all partaking in this. So now, um, you know, you have a formidable force of, of political power to, to, be, uh, to be back, to be back in the Taliban. And the United States is really nowhere in sight. Um, you know, Trump, Trump wants to get out of Afghanistan, if I remember correctly. Um, there really isn't any sort of uh, ultimate goal that the United States has to, to what they're going to do with Afghanistan because they've been there for 17 years now. And yeah. Yeah. From, what yeah. I'm, you know, from what I'm seeing in my personal observation is that they're not building up any infrastructure. Um, the, the more, the longer they stay there, the, the more, you know, it is off the people. And yeah. what you're starting to see now is that people are saying, well, I, why not join the Taliban? Yeah. And outside of any previous information, what do I have that, to lose? What do I have to lose? Right. Right. And like you said, they hold two thirds of the, um, what, two thirds of the population um, in terms of um, being pro Taliban. But outside of any previous information that. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, Mike will be back. Yeah, um, outside of any privy intelligence that we know of, of why America may be in Afghanistan, just looking at this and reading these articles and picking up the breadcrumbs, to me personally, um, it's like, well, why are we in Afghanistan? You know, it, it really doesn't make any sense. We're not building anything. We're not putting any quote unquote democratic policies in place. We're not uh, liberating any people. We're just there. And like I said, we've been there for 17 years. So what is the purpose? You know, we waste the money. You need to get out of this place. Yeah, I actually um, got kicked off as soon as Jack came on. Um, oh, uh, um, while well, I was saying uh, outside of any uh, intelligence information that we may, may not know of, but why America is in Afghanistan, you know, I'm just looking at the breadcrumbs. There's no real reason why we're there. Mm-hmm. What's going on, Jack? How you doing? What's going on, brothers? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you what you said on that. I know, um, I read an article uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago, and it was discussing this uh, war with them, right? So, like nine hundred million dollars, uh, twenty four hundred um, um, soldiers deaths. Um, that died in that war. So it was like, I think, I don't know, I really don't know what, what was the point of that war. I don't, I didn't, I don't get it. Um, but uh, U.S. took a major loss just going over there and, and dealing with those people. So Yeah, the, and... The point ahead, of Mike. the war, the point of the war was to keep Afghanistan out of China's hands and Russia's hands. And keep it out of... Can you unpack hands. that? Can you unpack that and explain? Because... I, I I don't get it. Like explain a little bit on that. Afghanistan. I wish Lino could actually put, bring up the um, the map, uh, the Google map. But um, let me, yeah, let me uh, try to. The point of the war was to was to actually um, corner Afghanistan and keep it out of the hands of the uh, BRI, which is the Belt and Road Initiative that China has. Um, as well as uh, keep the resources that China, uh, that Afghanistan has away from all the rest of the people because Afghanistan is sitting on a lot of lithium and they have a lot of oil and natural gas inside there. The whole entire Middle East and well as the, uh, that sort of corridor for uh, what what separates the Middle East and Eurasia um, is full of, full of resources. Yeah, um, this is Afghanistan. So all of the stands, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, then really that 
that's a real corridor right there. Um, so like you saying, Afghanistan has a lot of lithium. So um, geographically speaking, if one country, well, one mass land area has resources, then you would go to the next land mass, which is in, in geopolitically speaking, the next country to see if they have in the same only in resources. Like you said, when did um uh Xi Jinping announce the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh that was later on, I think in the in the later two thousands, but um there was always a concern that uh China as a growing power would actually uh, would actually go through there, right? Um mm. Because there, there, it was ungoverned space, and even most of Afghanistan is ungoverned space. I think like two thirds of it is ungoverned. Okay. Yeah, this whole corridor is full of the stands, and the just FYI stand is just turned for home of, so home of Afghans, home of Pakistan, um, Pakistan's home of Kazakhs. So yeah, this whole corridor right here is yeah it it, it 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 may be a lot of resources if if some is in or in afghanistan resources different type of resources may be in turkmenistan even iran uh pakistan tajikistan uzbekistan so yeah this this is what separates really what separates including iran um the um asian part of the world from the more going into the more uh, European part of the world. So you would also add Azerbaijan and things like that to that. But I feel as if um, I'm say Americans um, don't realize this part of the world. Don't, you know, don't even understand this part of the world exists and this is a, a big chunk of it you know so yeah uh. yeah i agree with that too um so politically right or uh, what are the taliban stance like what do they really want for Af afghanistan what, what, what's their stance does they invite look i've never heard any speeches i haven't really heard anything from on their end they're basically a, a fundamentalist uh, group, so they kind of don't like all the modernization that the world is going through, especially things like feminism, neoliberalism that comes out of uh, Western Europe. They're completely against all these things, so they want the same things that um, most most other um, homogenous countries uh, have, like Russia is a, it's a patriarch, they're a strong nation, they're pretty pretty much a uh, unified uh, country, whereas uh, in Afghanistan, you're, you're, you have all these blue-eyed, uh, pale-skinned uh, paramilitary people uh, occupying you. They, don't, they really don't want that. Um, the Taliban was born out of U.S. funding um, through uh, Brzezinski in, in the 70s as a way to drive out the Soviets. Um, and that's how the Taliban came to power. Now, okay, so now they're getting power, they're getting politi pol uh, political recognition, right? Um, what do you foresee for, for Afghanistan, you know, with everything going on, seeing that they're right next to China and, uh, you know, all these changes happening throughout the world? What do you, what do you think they're going to, what kind of effect are they going to put on globalization? Or, right, what do you think? Are you, you think are you going to be... Are they gonna make any power moves, or are they gonna kind of be silent because they don't have an infrastructure really? So, um, what do you think? Actually, they do have infrastructure. It's just been bombed to crap uh, by by the Americans. But uh, <clears throat> for the <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for the most part, um, Afghanistan is a is a third world country. They don't have the um, same Let's let's compare them to Nigeria or, or even Egypt. They're not in the same realm of develop, economic development, so they won't be there for another twenty-five years. 
so they it, what they're going to do on on a global stage is inconsequential it's not really it's not really a factor but there'll be a lot of job opportunities that does come out of afghanistan because uh there's a lot of uh, development that needs to take place which is what china pakistan iran and uh russia all, all have plans for especially with all that wealth up there um seeing that they have with oil and uh certain resources so yeah you know it's gonna be some, with those other countries contributing to the uh to the rebuild of afghanistan you know they can become they're gonna be powerful again so it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be kind of trippy to see how that plays out but i do feel sorry for you know you know for us you know going out there you know suffering all the losses and uh, financial losses and you know the soldiers you know that's terrible you know and seeing that they lost that it's just uh you know, it's tough to see that happen man and um it's kind of like it's something that we kind of just swept under the rug right like okay like it never happened but it did so um i have, I have a few friends of mine who went to war there and uh you know they're affected, you know what I mean? And it's like, all oh, that was for nothing. So that's, that's what really bothers me. All right, we'll get to our next article. All right, so this next uh, video is actually from RT. Um, Israeli military destroys TV station in Gaza amid massive border flare-up. Yeah, it was a lot of bombings going on in this video. That yeah, one yeah. big bombing. So the border flare up was, you know, normal battling between the Palestinians and the Israelis at the border. But the Israelis decided to shoot a missile at a TV station in Gaza. The Israeli Defense Force, yes. And what was the purpose of that? Well, outside of cutting communications. There it goes. And the building just falls over. Mm-hmm. For that exact purpose is to take out your uh, communications capabilities. You can't broadcast to the rest of the uh, Arab world that you're under attack if uh, you don't have any um, TV station. Hmm. But you still have social media. You still have cell phones. And per that social media, this got out that the building was bombed. Hmm. Now, I read the comments comments were uh, against this uh, Israel attack. Well, yeah, it's unjustified, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is unjustified. You have a bunch of people on the ground who are being illegally occupied by a, um, a, a foreign force. And you're telling them that uh, basically we're going to send in on, you know, the media says it's a war. A war is between two militaries. There is no military on the ground for, um, for Palestinians. They don't have mm -hmm. a, a standing military. They don't have tanks. They don't have an air force. They don't have a maritime uh, uh, security uh, um, blanket. They don't have that. They don't even have access to their own ocean because it's controlled by Israel. So mm -hmm. as it stands, you just have people with uh, Kalashnikovs and, um, and bottle rockets. Yeah, this is an occupy. Yeah, there. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, I saw the uh, the post video of like when uh, when they had daylight, and uh, uh, that building was like straight demolished. Man, it was like rubbles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think some of the people that that some of the victims, you know, that died from the uh, from the blast, right, were like innocent. So. You know, I think kind of what Israel and uh, 
you know, what's going on between Israel and Palestine, man, just getting out of hand, man. They've been fighting for a long time, and it's just... It's been out of hand. I don't know when it's going to end, because... I don't know. I don't know when. I don't see it ending. It's like this is like ongoing. It's never gonna stop. Actually, actually, it's already over. So they already declared a ceasefire this morning. And when you, when they declared a ceasefire, um, the defense minister um, Lieberman uh, actually resigned. It wasn't his. Why, uh, it wasn't his uh, suggestion to um, start the war or even call for a ceasefire. Yeah. It was actually Be- it was actually Benjamin Netanyahu who was the prime minister, and the rumors are speculating that he could very well be on his way out, and Lieberman could be actually trying to take over because they want new elections or snap elections, meaning they want elections to happen right now. So this could be this is this is huge. So, so I think what this means is, um, as a result of this, what has happened. It can result in political change. Well, what's what's Lieberman's ch- uh, views? Because um, why would he re- why would he quit? Uh, because he he his state his statement was that they surrendered to to to, um, to terrorism. Mm. Basically, they're saying that Israel surrendered to Palestinians who were terrorizing them. In reality, they're not being terrorized. They're actually have a legitimate right to fire off these um these mortars or these um these bottle rockets at uh at, at the state of Israel because uh they're being occupied by them. They don't have access to their own ocean. Um there was a fisherman, um a Palestinian fisherman who was out fishing in the water mm-hmm. trying to bring food back for the family and uh they killed him. Damn. They didn't just like walk up with a with a with a uh with a knife and, and stabbed them. I mean, you had the Israeli Navy actually uh, open up, open up fire with a um, thirty millimeter cannon. So, mm. so they're an aggressor. Anybody Damn. who's occupying you is an aggressor. Mm. And and to <clears throat> take it back to African Americans, black people, black people are being occupied in their neighborhoods by police officers who have these uh, who take advantage of the 1033 program that is issued by the federal government to have these MRAPs, armored vehicles, APCs, you know, camouflage uniforms in urban areas. Why do you need camouflage in the urban area? Um, all, all types of uh, surveillance on them. It's the same thing. So, Lionel, can you meet yourself? Um, what you're seeing is replicating of of uh of, of uh, colonialism so you have israel uh who colonized uh the palestinians and then you have you know white americans who are basically colonizing most black areas through uh gentrification as well as um criminalization of of, of movement so let's say in our own communities right um how can us as a black community, uh, you know, eradicate that, stop that. You have to be organized politically. We're not organized politically. I mean, you have Black Lives Matter and Hands Up, Don't Shoot, but those are very minuscule in comparison to what the civil rights movement did in the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And what the ANC did in South Africa, uh, starting from 1912 all the way up until Mandela uh, was released from uh, prison. The only difference here is that in South Africa, they got a lot of international support. The the climate was right for that. In uh, in black America, you don't really have that sort of international support, and neither do the Palestinians. Although I would say the Palestinians are more... um, They're more... um, they're more consolidated, right? So they they live in such a cramped space, and there's a million people in in, in a space that's only designed for a hundred thousand. So, just on that same topic, on a fundamental, like like to the essential, like how can 
how do we get it going, man? Like, uh, I know you want to, you, know, you always speak about complex thought, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to think first, because, you know, we talk about it, but it's like, um, getting brothers to get on one accord to get things going, because, you know, that is a step right there, really, to get that, to get that going as far as our organization, mm -hmm. um, and organizing. So, uh, what do you suggest could be the first step um, after complex thought well, discussion? One, one third of the work has already been done. If you ever go to um, Afro Synergy News, he actually designed, T. West, actually designed a, nas a national African-American political agenda for 20, 2018. He designed that a few weeks ago and put it on his channel. So that part has already been taken care of. It's more about getting it passed. Um, into in, in, into Congress and on a, on a local stage as well, but it's more of a national agenda, so it has to go through Congress. And again, I'm not, you know, too uh, experienced on how it works with Congress, but how do you get that presented to Congress? Uh, is Ryan like your uh, congressman, or you need an elected official? You need an elected like official that goes into Congress. Okay. What you see now on, on the national stage is, uh, is over 100 women uh, taking taking office uh, through, through elections um, in the last few weeks, and none of those women have our best interests, especially um, especially uh, African American women. They just don't have any interest in that. So you need somebody who's going to speak to your um, who's going to speak to your best interests on on a national political agenda. It's interesting. Okay. So, so we're gonna have that. to. We would have to. We would have to groom some black man who's well spoken that can actually speak to our best interests and uh, present that documentation up there, and actually back him financially um, to get to to lobby it and to get our, our um, the agenda heard at least. As long as it gets heard, then nobody can say that they never heard it. So at least it's out there. Yeah, you're right. So I think that will be that's a great idea, man. That makes sense. That makes sense. So we are definitely have to move forward with that. I know. You have anything you want to add? No, no. All right, we'll move to the next article. All right, this article is from TheGuardian.com. Merkel joins Macron in calling for a real, true European army. Chancellor, Chancellor's remarks come after Trump steps up attack on French leader over the same idea. Angela Merkel has said EU leaders should one day consider a real, true European army. Shortly after Donald Trump ramped up a Twitter attack on Emmanuel Macron over the same idea, Speaking to the European Parliament in Strasbourg, the German chan Chancellor backed a bold step in European defense policy as a part of a speech extolling the need, of, need for EU cooperation in, migra in migration, climate change, and counterterrorism. The times, the times when we could re rely on others is past, she said. To a mix of applause and jeers from uh, Eurosceptic MEPs, uh, she said, we have to look at the vision of one day creating a real, true European army. The chancellor said the idea would complement NATO, but gave no details on the ambitions. I, the ambitious idea could become a reality. So um, what's happening here is that France is really the the, the really the spearhead behind all of this because this started years ago with uh, um, 
in, in, in the 2000s uh, during during the uh, Iraqi War. But there was worry that um, France's economy is really unstable. All it takes is uh, one domino to fall in Africa, and basically you have um, you have a catastrophic failure for uh, for France. So Germany is the powerhouse of of the European Union, so they need to back they, they they're willing to back anything that can protect them as well, protect their assets. So if we put all of this all on all together is that um Europe Europe's political fragility as well as their economic fragility is leading them to to make decisions such as in the European army to uh quote unquote protect themselves from who? Russia, China and the US. Now why the US? We get Russia because Russia is an aggressive um power uh powerhouse in in terms of the um in terms of the continent that they share right russia spans uh the european continent as well as the asian continent russia also has energy that they sell to the european union um at very um discounted prices but if europe is dependent upon uh russian energy then what happens when russia decides to kick up the notch and become a little bit more aggressive price wise and things of that nature they're really at the behest of, of the russians they're worried about China, mostly because China is encroaching inside Africa, and Chinese Chinese policy inside Africa could actually uh, be seen as encroaching upon European capitalism inside Africa. More importantly, in the Francophone states, you have you have uh, you know. Uh, Two dozen states inside Africa that uh, Europeans rely on for their for their um, economic viability as well as their um, uh, mineral resources. If if it comes if push comes to shove and, and China and any other external power decides to push out um, European influence inside Africa, then that can be a disaster for the Europeans. Now, where does where does America come into all this? Uh, the United States is basically um, wishy-washy in terms of how they how they're going to handle um, you know the Europeans in case there is a conflict between Russia and, and the Europeans, or let's say uh, let's say uh, uh, China, China and, and the Europeans, because China um, is actually getting very um, is getting very aggressive inside. Uh, um, not just in Africa, but in, in terms of the Middle East as well. But the United States, you know, if they're talking about creating a Cold War because of Trump's tariffs, um, as well as some of his posturing, you know, that could very well, uh, if you're European, you're probably thinking, well, I have no friends, so I have to do something to protect myself. But can, can they really protect themselves? Is it really going to work as, you know, uh, if you got to if 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 a uh, UK is trying to uh, recruit um, Africans right into their into their military, they can barely keep their numbers up. You think they really can create a uh, a European army that's strong enough to uh, hold its own weight? Like, do you do you think that that's possible? Well, France is a uh, nuclear power, and the only nuclear power inside. Um inside the European Union. Now if you want to if you want to take into now if you want to take into consideration the um, United Kingdom who already filed for their Brexit cuz their Brexit goes into place in 2019. Um they're also a nuclear power as well but they're also separated now or will be separated soon. So if you're if you're the European Union you're saying, "Well, who's going to protect the European Union?" Right, because it's not so much about the the physical countries, but who's going to protect the architecture? Because if the if the United States stops paying the bills, and they don't pay their own bills, then they're they're, they're SOL. And you need some kind of uh, um, alternative to NATO because if NATO, if you can't afford to pay NATO's bills at two percent, you might as well build your own army. Hmm. Uh, that makes sense. Well, what's your, what's your thoughts like now? We've heard from the French president Macron a couple of um, couple of speeches in the past few weeks, and 
just about all the speeches has been toward Africa. Um, you got African countries, the few African countries in West Africa that they speak French. They hold their um, national currency, uh, French francs, and French banks. That's how French, and that's how France get a lot of its uh, money. Um, China is encroaching on the African territories, cutting off their their lifeline, cutting off their supply. Um, you have America and Trump that not these two countries, America, America and not the country, not EU, it's not the country, but the European Union are not a uh, buddy's buddy right right now. So. Like Mike said, you know, right now they see themselves as on the island by themselves, so they need to do something. This, I feel that this European army, if it were to come to fruition, would be mainly toward going into Africa and protecting or take retaking over its um, former colonial countries from China and fighting a war in these countries, destroying the infrastructure to get rid of China or say they got rid of China and recolonizing these countries. That's how I feel, that's, 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 that's what I see about it. That, that, that's what I see can happen if this uh, European army comes to fruition because you know they need money. They are not, like, you know, like Mike said, Germany is the powerhouse of the European Union, and you have Russia that's right there. Is they're they're building up their army. They're they're building up Russia, and you see that. So you're like, okay, you know, you got this beast coming up right now. So uh, I need some help over here, and now you have this. Okay, this is the help I need. So you, so whatever France will might say, hey, uh, hey Germany, we we we. We need to, we need you to help us go into Africa. They're going to do it because when Germany say, "Hey, friends, uh, Russia is encroaching. We need you to come over here." They're going to have to do it, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think? Now, what do you, what do you think is going to be? Uh, what do you think? What, what problem do you think is going to arise from uh, um, this? It's a uh, the army they're trying to create. What do you think? What type of problems can arise from this, man? Do you think it's going to uh, um, disrupt um, their international relationships with other countries, or is it going to? Um, yeah, do you think it's going to disrupt it in any, any type of way? Like, what, what do you think? It could. I mean, it, it could potentially uh, cause problems. It, it shouldn't cause any international problems because. The goal is to protect the European Union, not so much as, um, you know, not so much as uh, uh, launching an offensive into, um, let's say, Hong Kong. I, they, they, they have no intention on doing something like that. That would be suicide for them. Um, but the way how I see it is that uh, they need to protect the European Union as an institutional body. Because what happens and what's happening right now is you're seeing far right movements pop up all over Europe, from from the UK all the way back into on to the Ukraine, and these far right movements don't believe in the European Union as an institutional body. That's for one, and number two, they're more worried that the United States may leave, um, may leave a power vacuum inside inside Europe if they leave NATO, if they pull out of, of supporting NATO, then what's your alternative? You you would need some form of uh, Auxiliary force, such as um, you know, such as European Union, uh, European Army. So, notice that it's an army. They don't say navy. They don't say air force. They just say army. So it sounds like this is more of a ground offensive. Good point. That's a good point. Yes, army is a uh, uh, yeah ground. Yes, good point. For, uh, yeah, I never military. noticed that. They don't say military. You know, they army. Yeah. So they're 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 going to be on offensive and going into so yeah 
yeah, I I, I only see this army going into Africa, you know, <laughs> to, to, to be honest, going into Africa and defending you're the European Union from Russia. So do you, do you see any proxy wars happening um, uh, in Africa, you know, as far as rebel groups and uh, uh, over uh, territories? Do you, do you foresee that happening? Yeah, you see that happening right now in Greece. You have a far-right group, uh, basically a Ku Klux Klan in, in Greece that has basically taken over parliament. 90, 90% support on the ground. I know that. You're seeing this all over Europe. You're seeing these white nationalists pop up all over the place that are basically taking it back to the days of World War II. Mm. Or what started World War II to begin with, um, this sort of uh, um, eth ethno-conservative uh, um, fanaticism. That drove um, that drove your, uh, uh, Germany into into attacking other countries. But now it may not be Germany attacking other countries. It, it may very well be these smaller countries like um, Austria and um, you know um, uh, uh, Italy and Greece. You may you may see these guys take power in and load up the military because a lot of those um, a lot of those uh, uh, populist groups. Um, those, those those fanatical groups in, in uh, the European Union are actually people who came from the former military, people who were uh, who were actually active police force. And um, when a recession, when recessions happen, that's ripe ground for them to gain more popularity. Mm -hmm. And right now, they're actually killing a whole lot of the migrants coming out of Africa. So a lot of your darker, conflicted uh, migrants that are coming from Libya and, and Nigeria and whatnot um, are actually being slaughtered in, in, in Italy and in, in Greece and uh, Portugal and these places. You have these uh, right-wing groups that are just going around slaughtering people and they're gaining political power. Yeah, yeah, they, they are doing it in Greece. They doing it, they, they've been doing it in Greece for a while. Yeah, and once, like I said, once... Um, you know, Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, they are economic uh, situation starts to get weaker and weaker. They're going to turn on these migrants also. You know, it's, 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 it's happy-go-lucky. It's, uh, oh, we're one family. We're the human family. Yay us right now because everything is going well. But once bread starts to get $25 a loaf, Fuck you, nigga. Go home. You know it, it's it's going. I don't mean to curse like that, but it's that's that's that's, that's how it's going to be. Well, what happens when they can't get their ATM? Then they can't get their money out the ATM. Oh, it's going to be worse. Right, because the European uh, Central Bank decides that nobody can actually um, withdraw. You know, for the next you know seventy two hours or even thirty days. It's 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 worse. Um, which means they're going to see immigrants as the source of the problem they're going to see immigrants putting a strain on the resources they're going to see immigrants as people that are taken away from the natives mm -hmm. you know like i said everything is fine now because everybody can butter their bread but once everybody but once people can but once people cease stop being able to butter their bread the gloves are off, man. You 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 better go back home. You know, don't 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 think. Oh, I was born here. I speak Spanish too. No, you speak Italian, right? Yeah, you, or yeah, yeah. Whatever. If you don't look like us, you you gonna be without paddles. Mm -hmm. Now, if France was smart, what they would do is they would. If they're worried about the United States encroachment or, you, you know, having a Cold War with the United States or any sort of conflict with the United States, what they would do is they would butter the biscuits inside the Caribbean uh, of Haitians and other uh, uh, Francophone uh, states and actually make a peace, an amendment with, with, with Haiti and say, let's let bygones be bygones. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll help you rebuild your economy while at the same time, you know, build up a military to keep, you know, uh, uh, Keep the United States from uh, um, pushing its way through the Caribbean. 
that's usually what military that's usually what uh, um, imperial powers do anyways right so you you see the same thing with um you know france does that in africa and you see um you know you know you see them do it um uh, when i say them I, i'm referring to like uh, even russia you know russia what they did in syria was was impeccable and something that nobody could actually uh, predict and having that sort of backing in that capacity you know sends a clear message to everybody else around them that if you come here you know you, you know it's almost guaranteed you're going to lose uh, mm -hmm. what, so what I'm saying is that what Russia did for Syria, uh, uh, France can actually do for Haiti. But if Europeans weren't so racist, they wouldn't be in this problem right now. I agree with that. All right. Well, yeah, that's the biggest problem. And uh, they have the people, they have the army, but they, they, they oppress them, right? If they had work with them, they would have more strength. There's more numbers and strength. So they shot themselves in the foot with that one. It's more strength than numbers. Yeah, I said that backwards here, right? You go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I'll go on to the next article. All right, this one is from Russian Insight. Breaking. Russian, Russia considers reopening base in Cuba as U.S. set to leave the INF deal. So the INF is the intermediary uh, nuclear um, arms control deal that uh, was signed uh, in 1997, 1987 with Gorbachev uh, and Reagan. And the United States decided that they were going to pull out of it um, because the Russians also saw the necessity to pull out of it as well because it doesn't suit their interests. Right, you have missiles in Poland, uh, pointing at the uh, pointing at the uh, at Moscow. That's only about twenty minutes away. It only takes about thirteen minutes for a missile to travel that far. Um, the Russians don't have an answer, an immediate answer. They don't have missiles inside Cuba. They don't have missiles inside Mexico, or even um, you know the, the in Canada for that matter. So. If I was the Russians, I'd be I'd be looking at um, all types of uh, uh, options as well, and as well as pulling out of the treaty because the United States isn't upholding their end of the bargain either. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah. there's a, so there's a necessity to actually rebuild the um, military base inside uh, Cuba to actually, um, you know, uh, uh, to to uh, as a response to. Um, to the United States. One argument the video uh, discussed that would um, against why Russia will uh, reopen the base in Cuba is they were saying uh, during the Cold War era they didn't have any uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Mm -hmm. Now they do. So by them having that, there's no need to open a base in reopen the base in Russia because at that time they didn't have intercontinental ballistic missiles. But, you know, like I said, now they do. So that would defeat the purpose to open the reopen the base in Russia. But to your point, it's still a strategic move to say, hey, we're on your doorstep. Don't try anything smart <laughs> um, or else we're, we'll take it back to the Cold War. So even though they have the, the uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, um, having that, pres that presence in Russia still does send a message. Mm -hmm. Well, you also have to keep in mind that their, um, the missile technology today, that the, the uh, cruise missiles that they have, are actually capable of hitting the United States from Cuba. Uh, right into Washington, if not all the way into New York, um, mm. they're they're pretty strong. I think uh, their longest cruise missile goes about um, 900 kilometers, which is uh, fairly fairly far. Um, if you're talking about shooting it from Cuba, you can actually hit just about anywhere in the east coast of the United States. If not, it's not the Midwest. 900 kilometers would be like. Um, 
what would be the equivalent from Havana all the way into uh into southern Illinois at best. So everything east of the Mississippi River and on the eastern border is open for um for missile shot from Cuba from by Russia. Right, but would the Russians do that as a first strike, right? They w- they probably wouldn't do that as a first strike. No. They probably would do as, as a retaliatory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because like we mentioned multiple times earlier on different uh, shows that Russia is a defense uh, military. You know, they're, they, they don't go on the offense as a strike first, but from what we've seen, all of their military power, even though it's defensive they it do has the capability of become of become offensive but yeah Russia's MO is defense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's uh if if Russia opened up that base, reopen that base in uh Cuba, you know, then we at this point we gotta start thinking potential World War Three. Already in World War Three, if you really want to put it into perspective, um, you have eight different militaries inside Syria right now. You have the Americans, you have the French, you have the British, you have Iran, you have Russia, you have Syria, you have Iraq. Um, and I would argue that you also have Israel in and, in and out of that space, and as well as in Lebanon, who uh, basically closed up their border uh, with Syria and um, and um, in Lebanon to keep the terrorists from coming back in. So that's a, that's a Idlib, right? Uh, no, this is outside of Idlib. This is outside of Idlib. Okay, okay. So if you could a uh, quick history lesson, right? Um, I know there was a Cuban Missile Crisis. Can you explain a little bit like what happened during that time period and that, how that could relate to what uh, possibly could relate to what could happen if that base is open on in Cuba? Uh, what could happen there? Like, the, like what what happened back then? The Americans decided that they were going to put missiles inside Turkey, inside um, inside Istanbul, and Turkey is only a few miles away from um, uh, from uh, Russia's uh, underbelly, uh, which was which was the Ukraine at the time uh, of the Soviet Union. So, um. Russia decided as a as a response, or the Soviet Union decided as a response, that they were going to put missiles inside Cuba. Now, Cuba is only 90 miles away from Florida, which is only about an hour drive, mm-hmm. or hour, hour boat ride. And then you're talking a few minutes time uh, uh, by flight. You take a high-powered supersonic missile and you put it inside Cuba, now you're talking five minutes of doomsday. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about how much time it takes for you to put your, you know, to put your clothes on in the morning. You put it on one, you put your pants on one leg at a time. But when you have a missile coming at you, um, and, and you only have about 120 seconds to do uh, to respond, yeah, you have a big problem on your hands. Mm-hmm. So, what do you what do you think, U.S. the uh... Uh, the uh, uh, Trump administration, right? His a uh, his a uh, military strategic uh, strategic officers are telling him what he he should do. Seeing that this is going on, what like what can they do right now? There is nothing they can do. It's the United States who pulled out of the deal in the first place. <laughs> Damn, shot us up in the foot. That's just. Well, uh, I don't think it has anything to do with Trump. I don't think it has anything to do with Trump. I think it has a lot more to do with. Um, National national defense, uh, national security. Um, uh, I think that's uh, Bolton and Pompeo is uh, Secretary of State, if I remember correctly. So uh, I don't think it has anything to do with Trump. Trump doesn't. It's not uh, political. Uh, it's not militarily literate, literate in that in that regard. So yeah, yeah, he's not. He Trump is a businessman, and 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 this is remember the article we read a few weeks ago, uh, Jack, when Trump tried to rope China. And this INF treaty back it backing out, you know, saying whatever I forgot what he said, but he tried to rope China in it, and that really didn't make sense. 
Actually, it does make sense, right? Because really, yes, because China is not a part of the uh, agreement. So the agreement is only between Russia and uh, Russia and United well, you, States. But if, yeah. if China, if China has intermediary, intermediary uh, missiles uh, pointed at Okinawa, or even or even closer to, um, you know, closer to, to the Caribbean, it, that those rules don't apply to them. That means that the, the whole point of the intermediary, um, the INF treaty, was to keep those those missiles away from the borders of, of those countries. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it doesn't, it didn't make sense to say China had something to do with the INF when it was specifically about Russia and America. Mm-hmm. You know, at so, the time, at the time that it was written, it was at the time that it was written, it was. But now, um, you have several several countries that the United States has a problem with that um Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. That all have these uh, capabilities now. Now you're screwed. So he's trying to uh, I, I see. I see the tactic. Even though the INF just had to do with Russia and America at that time, fast forward to the present, what he's saying is, well, Russia not Russia, China has these type of missiles too. So he's trying to um rope every country that has these capabilities and possibly rewrite an INF treaty to get them from pointing their missiles at American soil. soil. Right. Well, hmm. not American soil, but American bases. Okay. Such as the one in Okinawa, Japan. Or Guam. Yeah, Guam. Yeah, that's a submarine base. Yeah. I see what, what you're saying. Yeah, you push the United States out of Guam, then it, it, you take the Pacific. I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Playing playing chess, not checkers, huh? Yes. Something like that. And Guam is... I want to say Guam is like... No, 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 it's not, no, it's not. I was about to say something, but I have to rethink what Guam was. Okay. Yeah, Guam, Guam's Guam's outside of uh, Japan, so it's it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's 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 about a few hours away, but it's uh, still strikeable by a um, a uh, by a, a medium range missile. Yeah, especially if you if you fire off, you know, uh, fifty, sixty of them at a time, you really can't do much about that. So. Mhm. Mhm. All right. Let me uh, get to the next article. All right, this one is from Press TV. Um, Taiwan Navy as two U.S. made warships as China tensions grow. So the problem is that uh, Taiwan is actually a um, a Commonwealth of, of of China, and the United States has been doing business behind the mainland's back uh, with Taiwan, and you're not supposed to do that. It will be the equivalent of of, of Venezuela doing business with Puerto Rico, but not talking to the United States in Washington D.C. And these aren't cheap. These aren't cheap boats. These are actually very. I, I'm not. A, I'm not a Navy person. Maybe Lionel can speak to this, but those look like. Um, those, those look like frigates. Yeah, those they look new. They are new. <laughs> yeah. Nice paint job. They're sharp yeah. too. Yeah. That, I don't know how the I don't know how the People's uh, Liberation Army or the China's yeah PL or well, China's Navy dress, but the Taiwanese Navy dress just like the American Navy. Um, Americanized, <laughs> right? You know, they, you know, they got the uh, neckerchief on and everything. Yeah, they got the satellites, the missiles. I don't know if the well, hopefully the missiles come with it. You know, what was the purpose of having a navy ship if you can't have the missiles to come with it? But um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they 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 got the they look like they had cracker jacks on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and please, if you if, 
if you're listening to this, look at the map and see where Taiwan is at, how close it is to China. Mm-hmm. America just spit <laughs> in China's face like, hey, forget you. Yeah, here go two shifts. They just spit in their face. Oh, my God, this is hilarious. Well, the thing is that China, in order for China to go to war, they have to take out Taiwan first. They do. They do. And Taiwan is sitting there spying. I'm like, we got two boats. Hey, y'all. Nah. Please look at the map. If you listen to this, please, please look up Google Taiwan and click maps and see where how close it is to China. And it's then put them going for Puerto Rico to the United States. And then look at and then look how their navy is dressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and know the fact that if China go to war, they gotta take out Taiwan. They they, they gotta re take over Taiwan. Hilarious. Yeah, they can't so, they can't they can't actually go to war with anybody else until they take out Taiwan. Taiwan is the first objective and as it stands right now, the Chinese Navy does not have the capabilities to take Taiwan. They just don't have it. But when they do. Yeah, because you have to remember that Taiwan is really, really dug in. They have a lot of U.S. military weapons, a lot of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and all types of uh, artillery. They're, they're pretty dug in. They, they can go for the long haul if they need to. So you're saying that was a... Okay. I think what matters, what, what what do you think was the message behind this? Because I think the message was the message is uh <laughs> like what's up like w- like <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah that's what I got of it so what do you yeah that's that's what I got out of it yeah so yeah um, the the the, the yeah, message like the, we the, don't care that's you know that's yeah. that's the message um because America was sending ships through the Spratly Islands the South China Sea. And, you know, things got a little heated, you know, uh, uh, Chinese warships following them. But now you, you got America send Taiwan two frigates, you know, brand spanking new. And, and, they, and, 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 and they out there with their Cracker Jacks on celebrating the delivery. Mm-hmm. You, I, you, you could actually say that the Taiwanese are bedwinches. That's a good one. That's a good one. That damn, actually, man. damn, damn. Wait, wait. I'm gonna use Jack's wording. That's deep. That is deep. That why I, I have not thought about it like that. That's deep. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, United States knows they have to keep sending arms because they they don't just have the uh, frigates and destroyers. They have um. I believe there's talks about giving them a, um, a helicopter landing ship as well, uh, and they just got a couple of submarines. I don't know what those submarines' capabilities are, but they, they're diesel electrics. Wait, the submarines are diesel electric? Yeah, they're diesel electrics. That's bull. That's that's. They're not nuclear. They're not nuclear based. They're, they're diesel electric. So they have yeah, electric. right. That's very limited. They can't even. That's just enough for them to to, to police the uh, to police their island to keep the okay. Chinese out, right? Yeah, that's 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 uh they can't really submerge for that long. <laughs> but okay, okay, yeah, but it's just enough to police the island, which is mm-hmm. yeah, I guess good enough. Well, good enough to take them from Taiwan to Guam, right? That's a that's a while for a diesel. It it'll they be slow. Refueling, though. They they get refueling, so you you have a ship that actually meets them halfway and refuels, and then they keep they just keep going. Mm. It'll be a slow, a slow um journey, mm-hmm. but yeah. Um, wow, this is hilarious. I wonder whose whose idea was that. I I I just wonder whose idea was that in the White House to say we're gonna give. Taiwan, two frigates. Must be freaking crazy. Man, I, <laughs> I whoever said this, somebody must have la- I'm t- somebody must have laughed or snickered mm-hmm. when that idea came up and said, We're gonna do this and, and what? You, you sure? It's actually a bold move, right? Because it is. What happens 
because you don't know what the reaction of the Chinese may be, right? The Chinese are very strategic. And they may take that as, uh, you give them two destroyers or two frigates to with all that firepower on you, they see that as a threat. Yeah. So if they see that as a threat, then what's going to happen is they'll, they'll probably just go in there and just, and just sink those ships. Fuck it. Uh, 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 first. Imagine if America gives Taiwan one of their old aircraft carriers. That's actually been the talk. Oh, that's been, that's been the talk for the last couple of years. <laughs> oh, I have to see what this goes. I have to see what this goes. I really do have to see what this goes. The problem is, how, how can they maintain it, right? Yeah, yeah. How, they, how, do, you, how do you maintain a, um, an aircraft carrier without without the Chinese going in and just saying, "Fuck it, we're just going to take this out right now"? Yeah, because the bigger the, the 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 bigger these warships are, the more maintenance goes into it. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the frigates are small, you know, they, they, even though they're small, they do have, they do have pack, they do pack a lot of power, but they're small enough to maintain. But if they, especially an older aircraft carrier that's been in uh, service for decades, you know, it, it, it's going to need a little bit more maintenance, uh, a little bit more oil on the uh, screws. So, well, you know, on the it elbows. It has to be used too. It has to be used. It can't just well, sit there. Right, right. It 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 has to uh sail around either at least at the very least sail around Taiwan a couple times, uh you no, know, a couple months, or you know, take a journey to um uh, South China Sea, you know. <laughs> so, wow. And the thing is if you if you if you send it out to sea, what happens when the Chinese start following it? Mm. mm you know. We just saw we just saw a Chinese warship and, and, and the U.S. warship actually collide with each other. Yes, I have to see where this goes. I have to, this. This is getting good. Mm-hmm. This is getting really good. I have to see where this goes. As the old saying goes, a fly on the wall. A fly on the wall. Uh, Zove Royalty uh, wants to know, can you uh, send a link to him? I don't have his have email. Yet. Yeah, and Dollar Wolf's not here, so I don't I don't know his email address. Yeah. Um maybe maybe Jack knows it. Yeah, Jack, do you know Zoe's um email? Hey Zoe, how about this? You post your email in chat and I'll send it to you and delete the email. But yeah, this is getting good, man. They gave them two Free is and they out there. Well, they looking. have cut, they have cutter vessels too. So they gave they took those old Coast Guard vessels, uh, those old Coast Guard cutter ships from the United States and sent it to them. And they gave it they gave it some firepower. Fifty seven millimeter cannons, um, you know some uh 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 surface surface to uh, air missiles. But then they out there looking like. Regular American sailors. Now you know why the Chinese are ramping up their their uh their navy their um their uh, navy ships. Thirty four navy ships in the last in the last eighteen months. This is this is I mean it's it's funny it, it's 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 funny it's like wow really. The, the the one area that 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 Taiwan is gonna have a problem with is. Getting people to actually fight for them. A yeah, lot, a lot of a lot of your Taiwanese don't want. <laughs> you're on an island. If it, it's a fifty fifty chance that you're gonna win, right? So you might be dug in, but how long can you dig in for? You don't really have an outlet. You don't. You're not gonna right. to another another place. And plus, you're killing your brothers. You're talking about families fighting families. Mm, so people are gonna be again. It, it, it's gonna be a certain amount of people against that. Hey, so I'm about to send the uh, link right now. But yeah, it's going to be a certain amount of people against that. Then they're used to. Uh, hey, so when you get on the panel, I'm going to delete your email from the chat. They're 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 used to that comfort, that the 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 amenities, the creature comforts. So they don't have a way where, okay, you have to. I don't know if Taiwan have it where you have to serve time in a in a in the military as part of. Yeah, they do. It's mandatory. Okay. I think everybody okay. at eighteen has to serve or something like that. Okay. Well, whew. 
it was mandatory at one point. I think recently it has changed. But um, and uh, yeah, it it was mandatory at one point and it changed. So now that it's changed to voluntary, a lot of people aren't signing up for this. <laughs> they're avoiding. They're avoiding it. They're saying, "Oh, my foot hurts," and you know, right. <laughs> You know, my dog ate my homework. Right. But they gave them, if they get, if America give them an old nuclear aircraft carrier, mm-hmm. whoa, this, this is going to be good, man. You may not this, need a, you may not need a aircraft carrier, but a helicopter landing ship is, is, is pretty, pretty major, right? Yeah. Because you have F-35 fighter jets that can do vertical takeoff. This is gonna be good, man. Taiwan, Taiwan is like really. I gotta disagree with you. I think Taiwan is like going from Dominican Republic to Miami. But that's what I'm saying. It's 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 it's, so, it's a it's a it's a hop, skip, and a jump. It's not yeah. like it's not like it's a you, you need to send out. You need to. Um, it's about an hour away. <laughs> What I'm saying is, it's not like oh, you you had to lay over it in in, uh, nah. in Guam or something. No, you you you're talking about uh, they they can see each other from I you know from island island. <laughs> yeah, they can. That's that's the hilarious part. That's uh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let me let me let me try to share my screen while we talk about this, because that is good. Because I want people to really see where Taiwan is at. Let me delete this right here. X that out. I, All right. Do you Ty- think that U.S. did this to kind of, you know, more like a diversion, kind of to create trouble in their own backyard? You know, so they start to, some trouble. No, they plan on keeping the surrounding China and Russia. Yeah. That's what this is about. They're surrounding them. This is Taiwan, this little island right here. Nice and cute. And this is China. <laughs> and over here, the little speck is Guam. Right there. But this is Taiwan, and this is China. And our plane right away. Mm, mm, mm. What's going on, Zoe? How you doing? Pretty close. Yeah. I'm doing good, gentlemen. Uh, it's I, I see you guys have a lot of interesting topics tonight. And, and regarding with Taiwan, the thing is, as I wrote on the chat, that China has more than enough manpower to occupy Taiwan. I think Taiwan. They no, they don't that. have. The, they don't have the lift capabilities. There's a difference between manpower and the ability to get your guys into that vicinity. Because once once you come across that dotted line, uh, from a navy standpoint, I think Lionel could probably speak to this, man. They. They can take you out with some with uh with torpedoes. Mm. You wouldn't make it. You wouldn't make it that far into into Taiwan without without taking some casualties. Okay, but, but isn't that why China's developing their ballistic missiles, kind of like the asymmetrical warfare capabilities to kind of overwhelm their overwhelm their enemies? Because I think they'll use their ballistic missiles, probably their cyber attacks, to turn off the electricity over Taiwan, and you know. So even if you did do that, right, what's to say that the United States may may or may not get involved in that? True. That's very true. That's very true. How much of a risk is the Chinese willing to take over Taiwan? So they would, so China will have to really beef up to have a real proper Navy. Exactly before they, why they're building up their Navy, 34 warships in the last 18 months. Right, before they invade Taiwan. Now... I think they are going to invade Taiwan, but they're they going to, they, they have, like you said, they have to build up their Navy first to invade Taiwan because once they invade Taiwan, America's going to come over. So they're going to need that beef, that, that, that beefing up to, um, uh, fight America's Navy, which means Russia is going to come in at some point in time. Also, this is getting good, man. They're out there on Cracker Jacks looking like Navy sailors. Oh my God, that's hilarious. What's going on, anti gravity? Hey, what's up, guys? How are you guys doing? Oh, good. Laughing, Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Laughing, laughing, Taiwan making me laugh, man. 
<laughs> Why can't he roll in though? He's uh, Taiwan as uh, America's Bedouin. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are. If you really think about it, those those Taiwanese people are still Chinese at the end of the day, and those are families mm-hmm. that extend in, in into China. So you have right. families, but families yeah. fighting families over what? The white man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I agree with you on that, like because they're, I guess, to a certain extent, different. They're they're not the same as they used to be. They consider them, themselves uh, Taiwanese, not so much Chinese. If that makes sense. Well, it, well, they've nationalized their identity, but what I'm saying is, they st- right. if you look at their DNA, it's, it's it's practically the same. Right. No, no, that's true. They they're basically Taiwan was the the loser if you want to put it that way, of World War II. Uh, right. Technically, they're the ones who, who gave up, you know, most of their lives, at, uh, you know, <laughs> fighting the Japanese. And then, you know, the CCP later on came and then cleaned them out. Well, originally, they they were warring. There was the CCP and then there was the Nationalist Party, which is now what is now modern-day Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And so I, I guess there's that history to it. So China wanting to take over Taiwan is – it's been something that's in the works since 1950. You know, Mao wanted to take over uh, Taiwan, but the U.S. But they were, you know, right after World War II, backed up by the U.S. So then he really couldn't. But yeah, they've been really planning it. That's why you can see a lot of the maneuvers right now in the South China Sea is for this exact purpose. And and one thing that I, that um has been circling while, about, around Washington for years. I mean, it's a crazy idea, but it's the idea of Taiwan developing their nuclear weapons. Now, China has said straight up that in the event Taiwan starts a nuclear program, that they're going to go to war. That's like the red line they, that they, they that that's a red line that if crossed, they'll go to war. But you hear people in the Trump White House kind of like floating that idea. I mean, if they do that, that's just China will have no choice. Yeah, but then if China invades, that means America has to come to the defense of Taiwan. Mm-hmm. That's 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 too risky. Now they have the capabilities. The nuclear weapons uh, dis- disassembled. It's, it's just a matter of them putting it together. It probably take them a couple of days or a couple of weeks, there, but they can put it together. Just like Japan has nuclear weapons and or they're dis- disassembled. Yeah, that's, that's very true. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's more it's more about the delivery vehicle. How you, how are you going to deliver it? Are you going to deliver it through a torpedo? Or are you going to deliver it from uh, a surface to air missile, uh, surface to surface missile? How are you going to deliver that payload? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true. And, and the and the other thing too is China could escalate somewhere else. They're like, oh, they're, they're like, I bet you you give Taiwan nuclear weapons. Okay, you know, let's help Iran get some nuclear weapons or. You know, you know, let North Korea restart their nuclear program, you know. So it's like one action has another reaction. I mean, it's not like the U.S. has all of the trump cards in its hand. Because the, uh, the Chinese, they probably will strike back. Probably not with the war, like you said. Because right now, they're probably not ready. Uh, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe another 15 years that, that they will be able to invade Taiwan. But... Uh, I think what what's more than likely going to happen is Taiwan will get nuclear weapons if 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 it look if it looks like China is about to reach the capability to overwhelm Taiwan and maybe even the U.S. Then I guess Taiwan will will start the nuclear program and that's going to be a major escalation. Well, they only have be- so much time. They only have so much time to do it. You would need you would need a very strong ally like Japan to come in and actually uh, you know. Um, help you with the labor. I mean, not to say that Taiwan is, is too incompetent to do it, but you have you have somebody who's already an adversary to China, um, to China militarily, which would be Japan. And Japan right. is already expanding. and they, they're already talking about building military bases outside of India. Mm. Yeah. And, India and, and actually, it, India, given India, um, uh, one oh, of the islands, Given India one of the islands to actually uh, put uh, an Indian military base outside of Japan. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's like East Asia is looking like Europe before the Great War. I mean, massive military buildup, 
so much tension. It's going to take one mistake to start a major war in the next 15 years, maybe 10 years. Mm-hmm. It's gravity. You were going to say something? Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you guys remember that one, uh, uh, not video, but kind of podcast that I sent you guys. Mm-hmm. You know, the undertaking of the invasion of Taiwan is, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult because uh, it has a lot of natural um, barriers and natural, you know, uh, just occurrences around the island that gives it a huge uh, advantage, right? Like having mountains on your backside to protect you in a way. So they they have like, I believe it was like an eight day window, something to that effect, right? Of which they would have to control and occupy Taiwan. And the Taiwanese are preparing, what was it? Like they have eight hours to defend themselves from China until the US comes. Mm -hmm. So originally I was thinking that, you know, the. Taiwanese would be more afraid that the Trump administration wouldn't back them in a war. But, you know, considering that they gave these uh, two warships to the uh, Taiwanese, you know, that might not be the case anymore. So you have anything else you want to add? No, that's, that's pretty much it. All right, we'll move on to the next article. All right, this one is from face-to-faceafrica.com. Israel turns to Ghana to back its bid for a seat at the African Union. I know you guys are going to eat this up. I'll just read the first paragraph. Uh, Israel has called on the Ghanaian government to back its bid for, for an observer status in the African Union, which it lost in 2002 when the former OAU was dissolved and replaced by the AU. By the AU. The request was made to Ghana's Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, uh, Shirley Akure uh, Bachwe, who is, in, who is in Jerusalem on an official visit at the invitation of the Prime Minister ben- Benjamin Netanyahu. What do you guys uh, take on this? I think... Uh... I did not expect this, right? Uh, what's what's Israel' motive on um, on even trying to do this? I, I don't get it. Power projection. Um, hmm. The African Union would be fools to allow this. I mean, Israel's a is a white supremacist colonizing state. I mean, it treats uh, um, black Jews worse than Palestinians. I mean, we see how the Israelis treat the Palestinians. I mean, Israel's not even part of Africa technically. Like, why would that? I hope the African Union, I mean, I'm not p- putting high hopes on it, but I hope enough African countries be like, hell no, we're not going to allow Israel to be part of the African Union because Israel has ulterior motives. No, no, fuck that. Jack, you have anything on this? Anti gravity? Oh, go ahead, Jack. I'll go after you. Nah, I was going to say, I don't think that uh, they're going to let them in. Uh, the only way they could get in is they buy the way in. But if they were to do that, that a kind of uh, uh, take all the. They do have to get in. I'm breaking up a little bit, man. Can you hear us, Jack? You're breaking up. I said, I said that they're going to buy their way in. Uh, they're going to buy their way into the in, into the African Union if they if they could get in. But uh, I think that the nation book is This is going to show you a lot. Well, give you a glimpse of what their matches are if they do step in. So, um, watch that display. Hey, hey, Jack, if you can, um, log off and log back in. Thank you, Grab, you can go ahead. 
Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I heard about this, I think, in an article I saw maybe like a couple of weeks ago. And it's absolutely infuriating like, that they would even think that, you know, that this could be a possibility. You know, like Zoe, I don't have the best, you know, view of the AU if they do this. You know, it, you know, I take some, I guess, hope since, uh, you know, a lot of the, world, uh, the rest of the, you know, the international community has really soured on uh, Israel, even a lot of their, I guess, so-called former allies. Um, but for something like this to happen, this is like the AU supporting uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa, you know, 30 years ago, and allowing them to be in the union. So yeah, I'm holding out hope that this isn't become a possibility, but any you know, world, uh, African leader who, you know, votes or supports Israel joining the African Union, they need to immediately be voted out or, you know, step down or, you know, something. It's absolutely unacceptable. But yeah, what do you guys think, Lionel? Oh, I know, Mike. I know. Oh, maybe he, he might be away. And another thing, too, is um, even if this was for development, yeah, I mean, yeah, the Israeli economy is, you know, pretty, uh, it, it, it's a pretty vibrant economy, but I wouldn't consider it a really game changer in Africa. And and, and, and just like I said before, what what are the Af what is the African Union gaining from allowing Israel to go to the Union, and why does Israel want to be part of the African Union? I, I know they want to have close ties with Sudan because Sudan has close ties with Saudi Arabia, which wants to counter Iran. But what what interest does Israel have in Africa, Egypt? I, I don't know. They're not even on the continent. Uh, uh, you, you don't you don't have you don't have to be a part of the continent in order to be an observer member of the African Union. So this is part of the reason why they wanted to drag Haiti in and drag Jamaica into the um, into the continent was to expand the uh, the expand for the people in the diaspora. Now Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel's um, defense is that they have a long history in inside Africa because of the Jews. And they're saying that the Ethiopian Jews go all the way back, you know, in, you know, so many thousands of years. So therefore, they're basically uh, 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 religiously connected to to Africa in that regard. That is powers. that is correct. That's an excellent point that Mike's talking about. That's right on the money. What's up, gentlemen? But I want to kick in on another point too. If people remember, even when Israel was first looked at being for formulated as a state, where were they first originally talking about? The state of Israel to be founded. Do you Uganda, guys know? Uganda, Uganda, uh, Madagascar, right, South right, Africa, right, right next to Uganda. It was looking. It was looking to go right there. So that's mm -hmm. where they were looking to form the state of Israel, um, in Africa. So the 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 Israelis feel as though that there is a, a very strong African connection, and without question, with the Palashi Jews and so forth. There's no question about it. Um, so that's why they're, they're trying to play their move. Um, I do not particularly like the state of Israel myself with some of the stuff they're doing, but trying to make this move here is a smart one. I understand why they're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. I was just going to bring up that um, Palestinians had um, had voted to actually join to be an observer member of the uh, African Union as well in 2013. Um, same thing with Haiti. Same thing with Jamaica. Jamaica is an observer member of the African Union, but Haiti is not. Um, the problem is that uh, the United States won't tolerate that, uh, or it's really Israel that wouldn't tolerate it, but the um, United States uh, basically uh, is interfering with that so whole sort of uh, political process. Um, and there's a very strong possibility that Israel may become a member of the African Union because they've been all up and down West Africa, Ghana, Liberia, um, Nigeria, uh, 
they've been all through uh, uh, East Africa and Kenya, you know, with um, Kenyatta, uh, the president of Kenya, uh, Rwanda, and with Paul Kagame. Um, and we all know that they secretly sleep with the Egyptians as well. So, uh, and in Ethiopia as well. So, correct. It, they they they're they're gaining a lot of support inside Africa um, by giving gifts, quote unquote, to speak. You know, um, high high uh, capabilities of of um, farming and agriculture. Um, you know, for some of these areas that uh, haven't seen rain in six months and things of that nature. So they've been giving them a lot of technology and also de desalinization of of, of uh, uh, plants for for uh, harvesting water, collecting water from the sea, so, because there's a lot of places in Africa that just don't see rainwater, so there's a lot of droughts. So they've been trying to buy their way in with, through technology, uh, which is which is a foreign policy that black people should have adopted in America. Uh, for whatever reason, Negroes don't think this way. But uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, we, I, I, I'm, I'm the same way as, uh, as uh, Nagon and the rest of the panel, that I, I don't particularly care too much for uh, Israel's um, position in, in the Middle East as well as on the world stage. But with the way things are going right now, they may, they may very well find themselves as being the observer member of the African Union. I mean, it's a smart move for them. I, I have to say, I, I, don't, I, I certainly don't approve of them being there because I think they're a rapacious nation, very, um, you know, um, rather savage in my view and, um, and, and, and racist and, and, and very racist. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would not like to see them there. Um, cause I think they would create a lot of problems on the continent, if, if you ask me. But, um, you know, politically and economically, you know, for them, it's it's a move, it's a move to be made. You know, can Afro can Afro Americans stop that with the amount of money that Israel will be putting in? And remember, Israel would also get a lot of sponsorship dollars from the United States. So, um, so, so there's there's some issues there. But we definitely should be on the continent. There's no question about it. But um, I, I'm I'm really not. I really would hate to see those, you know, you know, you know, those Israelis there, Netanyahu and his Likud party, and them, those fucking savages. I, I certainly don't would, would not like to see them there. But um, they just may get a shot to be in there, though. Yeah. So the only thing that would stop them from actually joining is the fact that they legally occupy Syria's Golan Heights. They illegally yeah. occupy Palestinian territories as well as um, uh, Jordan, Jordan as well. And and if they keep harassing Lebanon, then and they go to war with Lebanon, then that would be game over for them because there are a lot of Lebanese millionaires inside Africa that send yep. money back into uh, Lebanon. So that 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 will get vetoed really quickly. Right. For African countries, if they allow Israel to join, you know, the AU even as an observer member, that'd be, you know, absolute debasement. You know, unlike anything the continent has seen to this point, right? Um, well, other than, you know, what some of the stuff that the Europeans do. But for there not to be some kind of uh, coalition where uh, at least, you know, um, diaspora Africans, you know, in the United States, uh, in Canada, to have uh, observer status, you know, through organizations, you know, I think that's absurd that that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And for Haiti not to be in it, I think even if the U.S. denies it, that for them to still not go ahead and become not even just observer members, but like full members, them and Jamaica and uh, a lot of the other Caribbean countries as well. Cuba could even be a, an observing member of the AU. Oh, that was yeah. that's been long yeah, talked yeah. about. That's been long yeah. talked about when Mandela and um, Fidel were alive. They've been, they was talking about that, but even. Um, when Chavez was alive with um, Gaddafi, they were talking about building a SATO, which is a South Atlantic Treaty Organization, you know, combining all of the military power of Africa and, and, and Latin America together to take right. down the United States. And, and remember, don't forget the you know you know the war you know wars in Angola that were moving against South Africa and so forth. Um, Cuba was great, gr a very strong influence in um in in, in helping to, to to turn the tide. Uh, uh, in, in those conflicts, uh, more certainly more towards the Angolan side and so forth. So Cuba was a Cuba was a very strong international power in Africa, for sure. You know, um, going against you know the um, the West and and had and, and met a tremendous amount of success. So much, and you know, so much they were so successful. You 
you don't even hear about it in, 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 in the media or the news because that they don't want you to know about it. So, yeah, those, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, I was just going to say those MiG-21 fighter jets uh, were knocking off those, um, those F-5 Phantoms really easily out of the air um, those, uh, in those French Mirages. So they, they proved that Russian hardware uh, were very, very uh, much, not just an equivalency, but superior to American hardware at the time. Um, dog fights. Uh, the Cubans lost very few, very few men, and a lot. And a, and a little tidbit that most people don't know who are probably listening to this: um, the the Cubans actually brought the women, brought Cuban women there to keep the morale up uh, for, for Cuban for Cuban men. So they were in the trenches side by side with the men. They, they, they were there, and see, and that was the thing. That a lot, a lot of what a lot of people don't want to talk about is also not only their air fight game, but their very strong and very powerful ground game. Where they were fighting South, South African um, uh, troops, you know the Boers and so forth, and um, were, um, were beating them as well. So um, you know, l- let's let's be frank. You know, um, Cuba is going to have Cuba going to have some say there, and I think their presence in Africa has been more of a positive one than a negative. That's for sure. Yeah, they were actually in Syria in a 1973 war uh, in the Golan Heights, helping fight helping the Syrians fight the um, the Israelis. Yeah, uh, with the North Koreans and the, and the North Koreans were actually ones flying the jets for the um for the Egyptians and the uh, yeah. Israelis. I mean, not the Israelis, but the Syrians. So they, they, there's a lot of um cause homogenous um uh, military uh, science that was going on in terms of where everybody's everybody was on the global stage. You know, you had Cubans on the ground, um, you had North Koreans flying the jets, you had Vietnamese. Um, uh, uh, um, helping direct some of the war, uh, some of the uh, uh, ground fire. Um, mm. th- th- there's a whole lot of things came out of Africa that uh, most people don't even realize. You know, and having Israel inside Africa is like a slap in the face to African Americans because we built this country, but yet we don't have any say in it. Nah, can't have that. Well, you know, you know, a lot of that. See. If you want to get into that, you know, I, I I blame a lot of that on our political leadership. You know, some of the older guys like Parent Mitchell and all them who came out of, um, you know, uh, who had a lot of power on the in, in the Black Congressional Caucus and, and these people, they they turned their vision more inward and tried to deal with these fucking animals and savages here inside of the United States. Um, and we turned our eye away from really staying strong and plugged in on the international front because, you know, how a lot of those African nations and so forth got a lot of freedom and so forth. It was back, you know, uh, during the sixties and so forth, many of them were linked up with our movement. And we, we kind of, um, you know, we forgot that, you know, and we, we moved away from the international perspective and stayed more national and we lost a lot of ground that way. So I don't think it's within our interest just to stay here and stay, Stateside, we have to if we're going to consistently grow and and move stronger nationally as well as internationally. We have to have a very strong international presence. Work very closely with international movements and have many international movements in, in, get involved with us, and that will in, in, incur dollars and wealth and so forth like that. I mean, let's be very frank about it. Uh, even um, you know, the black Muslims, you know, they, they were you know the Muslims, you know, the, the Nation of Islam. They were working with Gaddafi. Gaddafi sent them a lot of money. You know, I mean, he sent them a lot of bread. You know, and the United States was very upset about that. But that yeah. was a, a, a very strong connection between Africa and and a very strong African group here that no one speaks about. The Nation of Islam at the time, one of the largest black-owned businesses in the United States, um, and, and and no one really speaks about that. We have to, you know, we, we can't forget that kind of stuff. We have to think broader than than we're thinking now. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know that, um, you know, the Black Panthers were actually um, when they traveled in, traveled into the um, into Africa in the Middle East, they um, were working side by side with the uh, with Yasser Arafat, you know, for the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. Right. <clears throat> and, and 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 the fact that we ourselves, the reason why the Palestinians are catching some hell in there, in, in there, left alone, we should not be sitting back here, not part of that movement. We should act. There is political and economic gain, and I'm not saying we should just be looking at it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. But um, there is a lot to be gained for us to get involved in that 
in 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 that movement. You Nicole, know, and I, I I do a lot of that work on the ground. You know, offline, I do a lot of that work on on the ground. So yeah, and we and we need a lot more people doing that. We should be a very big part of that. That should be a, that should be a very big part of what we do what we're doing here in the, in this country. Um, is, is is aligning is aligning with that movement, and as you can see, just how the movements are starting to make over in Africa for those who would call themselves Pan Africanists. Mm -hmm. um, this is be, this would be something that um, we, we we shouldn't we, you know we shouldn't be um, uh, off on you know we, we should be really we should be in in, in lockstep with them. Right. And, I, and I and I do know you know I know the you know um, uh, what do you call um, Black Lives Matter and some of the other movements we're starting to link up with them um, and I know we've been trying you know a lot of forces in this country have been trying to um, really you know discredit Black Lives Movement but but other um, but you know, movements and economic movements we should be having here should be working with them as well. We should be giving right. them money. You know, you know, uh, politically, our our politicians should be very closely in line with that. We should we should be in line with that deeply. But it, all these movements we should be aligned with because it, it it brings a lot more pressure not only out externally but it brings a lot more pressure internally on the forces that be here as well. You know, and what's interesting too, a lot of people probably don't notice that Gaddafi was actually sponsoring the IRA uh, in Ireland. At yeah, the time. he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he you was. Know, a lot of people don't know that. He was. Uh, he was giving him a lot of money and stuff. That's why they wanted him out. You know, that's why. You know, he was really moving in a powerful way. You know, they decided he had to really go when they started to talk about their own African dollar. And they were like, "Oh shit, France is going to be toast. Everything else is done. We right. we we we, we got to try to stop this." Right, and that, and that brings precedence to the to the EU army that we were discussing earlier before you got on um, in the beginning of the show. That uh, you know, uh, France is very nervous. They they're looking for alternatives to NATO, and you know, uh, an EU army is the only thing that can really protect the political infrastructure of uh, of of um, of the EU. Yeah, man. Yeah. Because you have to remember, a lot of people listening to this don't really understand that the. The EU is made up of unelected officials. Yeah. There is no democracy in the EU. That's true. That's true. That is true. <laughs> anyone, also, have, anyone have anything to add to that? Go ahead, Andy Graham. Go ahead, babe. Also, what I find, you know, to kind of be the most disingenuous is, you know, almost every night on MSNBC, you know, they're screaming about Russia and collusion, you know, interference in our election. But no one ever talks about uh, Israeli, you know, uh, influence in American elections, which is persistent and almost, uh, you know, almost complete left and right. There's no one who is, you know, willing to criticize Israel for anything, even if they, you know, murder children, they're going to try to say, oh, you know, it's both sides. Hamas is also at fault, you know? So, uh, yeah, they call it a, they call it a war, but what, you, what what people don't understand is that the political term for war is that there's two militaries in conflict with each other. P Palestinians don't have a military; they have people throwing rocks at tanks, but that, that's not the same as a military. Right, and they were sniping journalists in full view of the international world, right? And they still couldn't say anything. So that's how much political control, uh, you know, the Israeli government, a foreign government, you know, I might add. Well, well, I mean, you have APAC. Domestic, you, have, you know, yeah, you have APAC and so forth. You have some very strong lobbies here that really um, push a very strong political political edge here, which uh, I think they have too much influence. I look at Israel, to be quite frank with you, as a as a rogue state in the um, in the uh, in, in the region, doing whatever the fuck they want. And I think they've caused a lot of caused a lot of problems, and we need to speak out on them a lot more. There there have been those here in this country who have attempted to do so, and they've suffered. Uh, uh, because of it, and and I think the big thing about it is you speak speak out against them. It's like now you're anti-Semitic. No, that, that has nothing to do with being anti-Jewish or anything else like that. It has to do with more anti-Israel from the standpoint of its uh, of 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 some of the postures that it's taking in the world. And, and right, um, you know, and and, and they're a high-risk you know country in the Middle East, um, but yet we utilize them because you know we have a. Um, uh, uh, economic interest in the Middle East and that we use Israel to help us with. So that's that's what that's all about. It's, it's about that oil, people. You, you know that's the case. Anyway, anyway, go, go ahead, Antigrab. You guys are going to say something? No, I was, I was actually going to say that uh, we got two more articles to go through, so let me just uh, run through these real quick. Oh, okay. I just want to say one brief thing on this that kind of occurred to me as to why 
uh, Israel is trying to join the AU uh, is because, you know, as I was saying earlier, Israel has really, uh, you know, isolated itself from the international community. Really, they only have one backer in the UN, which is uh, the United States, which is Security Council is allowed to, you know, veto any, you know, proposition or, you know, as any kind of action the world tries to take against it. So, uh, but also what's really been hurting them, you know, especially in the pocketbooks is the BDS movement, which they're trying to ban in the United States, you know, which is a, a first amendment right to, you know, boycott whoever you want with your money. So they've really been hit hard uh, by the BDS movement. I think that might be their biggest motivation uh, for trying to get this kind of backing from the AU to legitimize themselves. The AU, the AU comprises of 1.2 billion people. Right, right. That, that's 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 one third of the popu- of the world's population. So. That's a that's a lot of folks. Yeah, a lot of folks. All right, let me get to this next article real quick. All right, this um, video is actually from RT. Uh, the FBI, Ukrainian Nazis trained with white U.S. white supremacists. So. This ended up on the geopolitics doc for obvious reasons. You have uh, Ukraine all the way close to Russia, out of the out within the uh, old Soviet Union, and you have white nationalists um, in America traveling back and forth to the Ukraine, as well as Ukrainian um, uh, Nazis uh, from the Sloboda Party, um, ending up in red states um, here in the United States, um, helping uh, foment. Um, solidarity between these groups and you have steve bannon traveling all through europe uh giving guidance and and, and our resources uh to these to these uh organizations these far-right organizations well well yeah that they, they were actually forming a militias in in, in the ukrainian army mm-hmm. that are actually a part of so they have their own militias that, that, that have been involved with it so yeah this has been going on for a while this is this is not new um the guardian was reporting on this um, a couple of couple of years ago, and that's when I first started hearing about it. And um, they were doing some short films about this, which were um, kind of interesting, and showing you um, some of this real racist stuff that was going on. And then uh, Putin was trying to put a little bit of, um, you know, he supports a lot of this stuff. He was trying to put some brakes on it because it was getting out international, and he thought that that was, um, uh, he saw, saw some of this as being problematic. But yeah, this is actually going on. And, um, I, you know, I don't know how well it's going to take off here because from what I'm looking at right now and from some of the uh, elections and stuff that are going on here right now, even Florida and Georgia and other places where black candidates are actually doing far better than many of us are, are looking at. I think some of this far right wing ideology um, that's going, you know, that they're trying to push. I think some white folks are getting a little tired of it. You know, the vicissitudes of politics here in this country move from the center, either center right or center left, not far right or far left. So um, they're pushing it here, but I, I'm kind of thinking maybe um, maybe this is not going to take off the way that the, the way that they want. Um, and looking at how the Democrats are starting to move now and taking over Congress and some stuff. I don't know. You know, we got to watch this very closely. Go ahead. It, it, it depends on how they treat Trump. If Trump doesn't win in 2020 or if he gets uh, booted out prematurely, um, it can send a cascading effect on to angry white males. And you don't need, I mean, it's one thing to see those guys in Charlottesville walking around with AR-15s with tiki torches. That's one thing. But what happens when you get random white males who decide to take a uh, U-Haul truck and drive through a predominantly black neighborhood where people are playing double dutch and playing in the fire hydrant in the summertime and decide to run over these people? Uh, you know, I think that would be really crazy because then when you start doing that, now you start to mobilize the, the army and so forth. And, um, uh, before you really start, you, you, you're making your movement look a lot worse. I think what's, what we're seeing politically here, um, in this, in this country now, and why we're seeing some of the, some of the vicissitudes of this game changing and moving a little bit more leftwards in some respects is because of the Charlottesville and, and these other, you know, murders and, 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 and terrorist attacks coming from uh, the far right that people, quite frankly, I believe, and it's coming more from the white community 
and even the black community are sitting there saying we're going in the wrong direction. And, uh, and I think uh, the far right and its cohorts and its movement has summited. I think it's starting, it's starting to slowly begin to move on its way down like most political movements happen to go, especially when we start seeing the economic situation or the economic conditions slightly begin to make some improvements where people start feeling better about their economic future or at least feeling better that, econ- that the economic game is going to be a little bit better with, with respect to a lot more jobs and people working a bit more, even though people may be jobbing two jobs or whatever. Um, um, the economy is looking a little bit better. So um, people are, uh, are starting to take a more critical look at some of this um, extremist activity and talk going on. That's what I think we're starting to see. And I think these midterm elections is a bit of a bellwether on some of this. And, um, you know, when I start looking at two black governors, basically, in my view, that have been elected, but they've had to steal the elections to do that. And all that's going on in the deep south right now. Um, even in Mississippi with some of the stuff that's going down, um, I think kind of speaks to, to, to those poor sense. Uh, so I look at this in two ways. Um, the reason why you have a lot of angry, angry white men is because they know that their birth, the, the, their birth rate is collapsing. They know they're going to be a minority. I read somewhere that, uh, uh, white people could unofficially be a minority by 2031. That's that's not that far. So for them, this is like their last gasp of hope. Uh, uh, last, Trump is like their last gasp of like white supremacy, of maintaining that power structure. Now, what Mike is saying is interesting that if they become politically irrelevant, Let's say uh, the demographic changes happen within the next 10 to 15 years. These white men are going to be frustrated. They're going to be, I guess, politically disenfranchised. They're going to be pissed. The economy is not working out for them. And they have guns and it could get real ugly. The only reason why they have not acted up is because they still believe in the vote. These white men still believe in the vote, even though you know, the, 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 the party that they vote for kind of tries to suppress the vote of the, of the opposition. But at some point, demographics is going to take hold and it, it's going to be a flood. And for these white men who have their guns, all they cling to is their guns and vote. If, if their votes don't matter, I, things could get real interesting, could get real sticky. They could feel like they want to take their country back, literally. There's enough guns and these crazy white dudes out here to start some shit. The only reason why they haven't done is because they haven't feel disenfranchised yet. Trump empowered them, but if they start losing elections after elections after elections, and they can be like, what the fuck, then get frustrated, and they, they're going to lash out at some way, some way that they're going to lash out some way, and we're starting to see the beginnings of it. So. Well, well, well what, what you have to take a look at is, at the end of the day, these, some of these guys who are trying to jump out here and get crazy, they, they, they're going to have to fight white people, because you're coming down to dollars and cents. It comes down to money. At the end of the day, and who's in control of the resources and who isn't? Um, that's that's kind of where where are you looking at this thing? And if you're going to try to start some giant race war, whose pockets are you looking to lighten in in, in, in that regard as well? And do you think that the one percent is going to sit down here and say this poor ass white dude that ain't making it is going to sit here and take my shit over? You got to look at this thing three dimensionally. And um, that's a very good point. From where I'm looking at this right now. Motherfuckers better get in line or get, well, taken out, or get taken out of it. And I think that's what we're looking at. I mean, technically, probably not a race war, but I don't know, maybe like a low-level insurgency. I mean, you can see them start clapping up. At it's, it, it, it's been going on already. You, you, you're you seeing that. I mean, mm-hmm. we've, been, we've, we've been seeing that for quite some time. And um, what has it done? So, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, we, I mean, we can, we can look at what's happening on the border right now with this caravan. You, you're seeing white militias show up. You know, to defend the border, as if we don't have a a, a CBP, or, you know, Custom Borders Patrol and, and uh, National Guard are already down there. Like, why 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 do white men feel that they have to defend the border? You don't see black men showing up at the border, right? You don't see these. You don't see the um the Huey P. Newton Gun Club showing up to the border to defend the country. Like they they don't feel that way, right? So there's a difference in how they perceive things um in mm-hmm. terms of, uh, politics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they're, they're there, and, and you know, and a lot of that, 
border stuff is still overblown. Many of these people are already going into going into Mexico and so forth. They ain't coming up here. They're still a thousand miles out of here, man. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, um, I know this is being played for a lot of um, political mileage, uh, you know, certainly ginned up dur- for, for the midterms, no question about it. And, I, and I'm, I'm not so much so concerned about what these people are really talking about. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what's real, what's Memorex, you know, and who's, who's trying to spin certain things up for certain, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, for political gain. And um, the political season right now is um, for the midterms. All that is over. Um, now what we're looking at is the president really looking at what's happening. The you know some of the frightening uh, prospects that he can lose, especially looking at Florida and so forth, where you know you, you know where these guys have suppressed the vote, and you got a black man that technically, as far as I'm concerned, has been elected governor. Even though he's not going to get elected governor, I don't think they're going to let that. That happened with respect to how they're suppressing the vote, but that's what they got to do in order to win. So that that doesn't bode well, man, for for um for these for these guys coming into 2020. So I know a lot of people are f- afraid. I know they f- they fearing this white man. This white man is going to come up and strike and create a war. Uh, I think um, a lot of that is being overblown as well. And the the, the issue of them going to the border. I, th- I think it's just more of a fact these guys just have itchy fingers. You know, they have all these guns. They want to have a reason to use it. But, I mean, it, it's one thing to have all these guns and you go to a range and start shooting. But what happens when the other side starts shooting at you? Like, are, are you going to have that same heart that you had when you was in the gun range? So uh, a lot of these white militias are just trying to play soldier. Like, most of them are lames anyway. So. And, and, and when they face real tanks... And real troops that many of us are in, because the black man is the best trained soldier in this country, whether you know that or not, um, there's going to be a lot of issues. So, you know, you have to understand, um, you know, there's certain people who are controlling the gold and others who aren't. And these four white trash dudes who ain't got nothing, they're going to be looking at them as nothing but a bunch of pale skinned white fucking monkeys trying to get what they shouldn't have. And they're going to mow their asses down like. <laughs> Like weeds, uh, that's, that's, that's really what's coming down here. I don't think a lot of people quite understand the nature and state of this republic and what it, re- and, 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 and what it really means. And um, some of these white guys, I think, have lost sight of that as well. I, I don't know, Nago, man. The last time uh, Jared Taylor was on the Hangout, man, you tore him out the frame and uh, he had to go back and go tell his buddies. <laughs> yeah, they ain't seen, I ain't seen Hide No Head, them fucking savages since. But anyway, um, yeah, I told you. I, I told you I'd tell her what he was. He said, you up in here crying like a fucking hoe. The fuck out of here. You know, you don't, you don't, come, in the, you don't come here in the black manosphere talking. You're talking that bullshit. Send you yeah. home like the fucking half a fig you are. But anyway, go ahead. And you got sisters out here, uh, you know, having mongrel babies. So No, they haven't been mad mongrel babies. They're talking about they love that white man. Well, I, well you know. Let me show you how it's Wait, wait, wait Jared Taylor. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, Jared Taylor actually came to the black brain trust panel and no no he he, no, no no he came to obsidian's for a, a panel oh, and, uh, and i uh, and i tore sense. and i tore his ass out the frame mm-hmm. and, and brothers you know and, they, and, you, and you had a few um you had a few black bastards a few fucking shines uh, that that were inside of the uh uh, uh the, the obsidian camp who who, who 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 were mad at me about it but them fucking moolies they kept their mouths quiet since so I don't give a fuck about them, but uh, but but take but, their wrenches away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, whoever they were, they would they would do wrench. But you know, they, you know, stay away from me. You know, don't, don't you know? You know, you go to the city and talk and whisper behind his back. Don't come to me. Yeah. I, I I will I will deal with you. But anyway, um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah but those black, but those motherfuckers, they stepped off. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead yeah, let me get to this next article. Um, so this next article is from uh, CGTN. Um, Tunisia. Uh, criminalizes racial discrimination now, something that hasn't been done before. Uh, basically, if you discriminate against somebody who is black, um, you can actually find yourself in jail for three years and, um, and paying a high fine for it. Yeah, they're pretty good. I think they're looking at the sign of the times. They understand where how things are going to be growing. It's a pretty smart move. It's a good business move as well. Good business. Good business as well. Very smart for them. I mean, uh, I hope other, well, hopefully, uh, other North African countries to do the same because these North African countries they 
they hold a, a negative view on uh, on black Africans. I mean, most of these North Africans consider themselves Arab or Berber or whatever, and they believe they're superior to Africans. So hopefully yeah. countries like Egypt and maybe uh, Morocco f- f- follow f- follow through. Maybe Algeria and, and Libya. I mean, even though Libya is in chaos, but still, yeah, blacks in, in those countries are treated horribly, horribly by these wannabe Arabs, so... Right. Yeah, you know, Gaddafi was always the stalwart, you know, of Africa, at least in that sense. You know, he held back a lot of the other, you know, as they like to consider themselves Arab, but they're not really, uh, you know, Arabs in North Africa. What would they be? Um, what would they be considered? Um, they're not really Arabs. What would they be considered? Uh, no, what, 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 what would they be? What, what uh, would they be considered? They- they would be considered. Um, I, I forget what the term for it, but it's like uh, not not in, not indigenous. It's something to the effect of a Berber. I think they're Berber. N- no, Berber. Berbers are something else. It, it's kind of like they're Arab in the sense of language. Outside of that, they're not Arab. If that makes sense. Like for example, Palestinians, they're not Arab. Uh, the Iraqis, they're not Arab. The Afghanis, they're not Arab. They consider non. Uh, the word is escaping me right now. But when you say Arab, Arab, that's it's the Arab Arabian Peninsula. That's the real Arabs, if you want to put it that way. And then every everything outside of that, they're not considered Arab. If that if that makes sense. It doesn't. It doesn't but I, 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 <laughs> let, I let me look up the to, term. Right, if we want to try to look look it up, I would like to see more. Of it. And the thing is, you know, North Africa is just uh, – there's been so much racial mixing going on for, like, centuries. I mean, you had the Arabs came through. Then the uh, before that, the Romans controlled North Africa. And then after the Romans, it was, you know, the, the Muslim empires. And then, you know, there was a lot of racial mixing going on. So they became, like, I guess, like, like almost like mulattoes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because well, you had, North Africa, they're basically the mulattoes at this point. Because you had you had a lot of black Africans there, you know, a lot of people they weren't there, of course, they were there from the day one. Um, and then there was a lot of mixtures that came from a lot of different areas. I mean, it's, even as from as far as Norway, um, the Vikings and so forth, we came rolling through there as well. So um, you've had so many ethnic, you know, um, so much ethnic mixing through that area. It's uh, yeah, diluted yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. O- o- over the last two, three thousand years, it's, it's been incredible. But they were a black people, that's for sure. Earlier on, and, and regarding to uh, racism tor- tor- towards blacks uh, in North Africa, that that's the reason why after the uh, after Gaddafi was killed, a lot of the Libyans uh, were persecuting blacks. I mean, we, we remember yeah. the video. We, we remember that video. I think from two years ago. Yeah. Showing West Africans being enslaved, kept in cages, because they, 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 they that was disproven, though. Yeah, that, that there was a, there was a lot of um, uh, you know Hollywood propaganda behind that. Um, the the mm. U.S. State Department actually, um, and I wouldn't say the State Department initially, but there's a lot of um, intelligence agencies that know how to ratchet up. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You know, same thing with the, um, with, you know, with the Michelle Obama bring our girls back. Well, before they took the girls, they actually took the boys, and nobody said anything about it. Yeah, so I that's remember a, that's that because I read a story uh, uh, when Boko Haram took all those girls. They took like a similar number of boys before, but no one cared about them because it was, you know, that whole black girl magic bullshit. So they wanted to gin up support on social media. You know? Yep. Just they figured if they grab a bunch of boys, nobody would give a fuck. So you mm-hmm. still, even if you're African boys or black boys here in the United States, it's kind of like uh, what Officer Charles on BGS's uh, uh, panel says that no one cares about black boys. It's like no one cares about black boys or black men. So I, I think there's an awful lot of truth to that. Mm-hmm. Hey, uh, Jack, do you have anything you want to add? Jack. I think Jack might be away. You should have went, man. He got his foot on his neck. (laughs) (laughs) 
let me get to this one last article. So this um, this video is from RT. Uh, will Brazil withdraw from the BRICS because of the uh, election of um, the latest uh, president? So my view is, I've been talking to some Brazilians. I think they will. This guy is a uh, they got this far right piece of shit up in there. Who, quite frankly, uh, my understanding is he has some rather strong connections to the CIA as well. Um, uh, yeah, the name of the game, this whole coup movement that went on in Brazil was to try to keep them from really kind of moving outside of um, of the United States orbit, if you will. You know, once again, it's the whole Monroe Doctrine, but yeah, that's been a big part of it. Um, so yeah, I think that they would definitely want them to move away from the BRICS. And um, yeah, I definitely think so. I think that's a big part of why this whole coup game went, this whole coup, that's what I call this, I call this shit a, a, a coup d'etat over, over time in Brazil, that country got cooed bloodlessly, but that's where we are, and it's under absolute um, American control now, with this with this fucking um, with, with, with this filha da puta sitting there, so mm-hmm. you know, that that's what I believe. But anyway, go ahead. Go ahead, Anti Gravity. Oh, no, I have nothing. Uh, you guys go ahead. I have... Go ahead, Zoe. Yeah, uh, the, the, I mean, the new president, Jair Bolsonaro, he's very pro American. Um, he said he loves Donald Trump. And his supporters are, they kind of remind me of these rednecks we have over here. They're going to build up the election. They'll be posing on Instagram or Twitter with their guns because he said that he's going to um, relax gun laws in Brazil so the average Brazilian citizen can fight crime and as if that's going to lower the murder rate, even though it's going to increase the murder rate. But um, with this, breaking up the bricks, I, it's, it's a big blow in, in that sense uh, to that. However, Brazil's economy is... It's going through it's, it's going through tough times right now, and this yeah. Bolsonaro dude has no economic plan. He really has no plan how to fix the Brazilian economy. He's just kind of like Trump. He's he a says sick. simple shit. Oh, I'm gonna fix it. I'm He's a strong sick. man, and vote for me. And I'm not corrupt because I haven't been in because I haven't been exposed yet in any a corruption he, scandal. He's and, CIA. Uh, He's CIA. Yeah. yeah, that is a CIA guy. He's a mm-hmm. confident, he's a confident, intelligent, and assertive male. He said, "They're going you ain't shit." Oh my, my, he's a motherfucker boy. <laughs> Open. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> oh my gosh, Jesus Christ! Anyway, <laughs> that's a good one, bro. That's fucking good. That's good as fuck. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I say <laughs> he, yes, he is a part of that as well. But he's also part of the the, the other true CIA up in. Up in this piece of Central Intelligence Agency, <laughs> he's, he's, he's on their payroll. Fuck it, he's on their payroll. He's he's he's, he's one of ours. If, let's just put it like that. If you guys wanna wanna know, and, and see, people tend to forget. Oh. <laughs> Mike, Mike, you a motherfucker. Anyway. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was saying like people tend to forget that during the Cold War, um, if you look up, I think Mike knows this. I'm um, Operation Condor. In South America, the, the Brazilian military regime with with the United States helped overthrow and orchestrated coups in South America and in the Caribbean. So Brazil and the U.S. have been like, I, since the during the Cold War, we had very close ties, and those ties never really went away. Even though when Lula came to power and and other Brazilian presidents, so. That connection, that connection is still there with Bolsonaro there. I mean, uh, I know you guys talked about, you know, uh, uh, Bolsonaro of Brazil and Colombia trying to invade Venezuela. 
I mean, that, that, I, that's probably the reason why the CIA put him there, because they want to start something in Venezuela to overthrow, uh, to, to overthrow well, the, the government well, there. Well, well, it's more that there's a big economic piece to it. You know, um, you know, Brazil, when I was down there, they found one of the biggest oil. Um, oil Petrobras. Yeah, Petrobras, you know, one of, one of the oil, uh, one of the biggest oil shells that they found really in the East. They're talking about, um, you know, in the West, excuse me, even this, this, this could outshine Saudi by, by, by quite a bit. So they have unlimited, almost, they, they literally are sitting on almost an unlimited oil supply right now. Uh, it's deep in this deep down, but it's, 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 it's almost un- unlimited. They and, found a very, no, go ahead, finish. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and you know, all this, all that said and done, Brazil really wanted to control that 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 their their own economy, control the oil, be a big oil um, uh, producer, distributor, and all. And the United States, you know, you know, didn't want to get cut out of this. And that's what this is really all about. And they needed to have control of that that oil. Petrobras is a government um, based corporation. Um, run by the um, run run by the Brazilian government and and all that and you know we wanted that we wanted that you know we we couldn't have those lefties in there um, running that country um, so you know this guy who's in there right now this sucker people don't even like him people look at him who the fuck is this guy this is, he doesn't reflect the Brazilian people in the Brazilian mindset he doesn't reflect that at all he's you know he's reflecting some 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 strange shit. You know? He <clears throat> he he expressed that he was going to support Colombia in the invasion of of of, of, of Venezuela. They, they and, and they said four hours later he got a phone call from Moscow from Putin and said, "Do you want to confirm that?" He's, and then the next day there was a report that came out in the news that says that uh, Brazil will not be participating in any interventions inside Venezuela. Yeah, you know. So you know, Venezuela has a lot of support from 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 from, from the old Soviet Union. I still call them the old Soviet Union, even though we call them Russia. The old Soviets, because, you know, the old Soviets are in power still right now. They're in power. Mm-hmm. Um, once again. And, um, you know, they have a lot of interest there. And, um, you know, even going back to the days of Chavez and so forth. So they, they ain't going to let them come rolling through there that easily. And that's, that's a problem. It's throwing the side of America. We tried to coup them. We sent our economic hitmen down into Venezuela to, to shut them down. And, um, you know, it, it didn't really work. So we're trying to seriously destabilize their economy. To have war in that area right now is um, it's kind of crazy. But um, I don't think that's going to take off the way we would like. But the Brazilian leader there right now, when you see him, it's CIA. They got 5,000 troops on the border with Brazil. On the border. And, uh, with- Still, um Venezuela, and then they said they another five thousand moved up in Colombia on the border with Venezuela. So, uh, you know, they're they're talking about some um, some clandestine type of operations going on. You know, to uh, to to bring down the uh, Venezuelan government. The only problem is what you're going to do about Nicaragua because Nicaragua has a pretty strong military uh, within that region. They can respond pretty pretty quickly as well. Um, they're also talking about Cuba and maybe intervening, you know, sending. Uh, l- l- let's just see. I, I, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, you know, rattling going on and trying to say what they're going to do. But, um, you know, this may all be a move to make everybody kind of sit down at the table. Uh, we'll, we'll, check on your apartment down your, uh, your, your property. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in contact with every day. My boy Dave is uh, handling every, he's handling all the rentals and everything else like that. So I, I know what's going on. But you know, well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think we're going to see this type of war that people, people are saying. I, I, I don't, I don't think so. But as I said, we do. You know, the the Brazilian government right now is being run by the CIA. Well, what they could do is uh, probably not start a war, but probably instigate a civil war in Venezuela, probably get some defectors from the Venezuelan military, arm them, and then have them start well, some shit. Kind of, like well, they did, kind of like what they tried to do in Syria. Well, see, what, what, they, well, what they want to do, they want to destabilize the government in, in such a way and destabilize their dollar 
and so forth. So they don't come with their own dollar to really have those guys kind of get very destabilized, not move, and then have us see if we can get in there and control the circumstances of its politics internally in that country as well. Um, but you have the Soviets. You know, I keep calling them, I don't care, Russians or not, I call them the Soviets. Mm-hmm. You still have them up in there, you know, making their moves, and Mike's right on the money. Yeah, you, you, oh, you guys really, you really want to make this move here, Brazil? You really want to come in here, really? And Brazil's like, okay, maybe we, we got a lot of issues here, let's chill. So that's kind of where they are right now, and I don't, you know, I really don't think we're going to roll in and start a proxy war um, in South America right now. Yeah, uh, and the, uh, the, the Bolivian president already came out and said that if there's any intervention inside of Venezuela, that they will be assisting Venezuela. Yeah, so, you know, you know, they don't want a proxy war, man. They don't want that. The United States, they don't want that. They commit a whole lot of troops there. We, we don't want that. It's not the move we want. And I know we got a lot of extraordinary fools uh, in, in, the, in the White House right now with, with some of their neocon types of um, views in the region, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know if we really want to set that off. I'm, I'm not seeing it. You know, there's a lot of saber rattling, but I, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing any real moves being made. I can't say that, that I'm 100% correct about that. I can't say that. It could easily be wrong. But that's just my view. But, Mike, what are you, what are you thinking? How, how are you seeing this? Uh, what I'm seeing here is that um, my observation is that Venezuela is going to have to figure out a way to uh, turn its co- economy around pretty quickly in the next 18 months or so um, in order to stabilize the, stabilize the population uh, and to keep the uh, Colombian gangsters from coming in and trying to, uh, the, car- the cartels from coming in and trying to exploit the people as well as some of the resources that's on the ground because mm. uh, they're, in de- they're in high, they're in desire, um, they're in high demand for um, uh, medicine. So there's a lot of medicine that's uh, being mm-hmm. affected by the sanctions that the United States has put on it. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> there's, there's, there's a lot of drug drug hustling going on, pharmaceutical oh, hustling yeah, going on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah um, you know, people, diet, diet, diabetic um, medication and all types of uh, um, birth control, not birth control, but birth, um, uh, 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 medicine for women, basically, um, that women need um, typically, you know, uh, pack smears and things like that, machines and stuff like that that need to be prepared and they can't get support for it. Now, the problem is that uh, ConocoPhillips um, has basically been trying to strong arm uh, Venezuela and Venezuela is strong arming them back by saying, if you're doing business here, then you have to pay restitution to the people, um, to the government itself. So, And that's what's causing the conflict now between the United States because I think ConocoPhillips is actually a uh, United States company and not... Yeah, not it it is not a, not a South American company. No, it isn't. Conoco, no, it isn't. It's an American company. Now they've discovered oil outside of um, outside of Haiti, and there's a lot of Venezuelans inside of Haiti right now, hoping hoping um, hoping build up the uh, the Haitian economy down there. Um, I was talking to my neighbor who's a Haitian. She has property down there. Her and her husband and um, says when she went down there um, in October, in October, it was full of Chinese people. So, you know, there's Chinese people running all over the place, Venezuelans all over the place, Ecuadorians, Brazilians, they're all up in there, everybody except African Americans. So there, there's a lot of uh, moving pieces happening right now in Latin America uh, where there's gold inside um, Dominican Republic. And, and you know, the Venezuelans got a, a 100% of the contract inside um, Dominican Republic. And they also have a contract inside Haiti. So. United States is doing whatever they can to try to uh, prevent them from getting these resources out. Yeah. Because they have Tony Rodham, which is Hillary, Hillary Rodham Clinton's brother, in there stealing those resources as well. Yep. Yep. That's the a, that's a truth. That, that, is, that is the truth. Um, I'm as a Haitian, uh, I'm Hillary Rodham's brother. Also, he controls, like, I think the biggest uh, telecommunications company in Haiti. Like, he's the president of it. And he has a lot of pull within the, the Haitian government. And he's friends with those blood-sucking Haitian elites who, who, continue oh, to sell out, who continue to sell out their own country to the United States. So, those, guys, those guys should be removed. You know? That could actually happen. That could very well happen. They, you know, they need um, to be removed. Remember when, they, when, when, when the... Um, 
when the uh, terrorists took over Haiti, it was only 80 terrorists. It wasn't that many of them. You know, you're yeah, talking yeah, an island yeah. full of, you know, 10 million people. You only took 80 guys over to strong arm your government. Yeah, you know, and then they and they were supposed to have, you know, this real strong security force of Tonton Makuts and all that. I mean, it just a bunch of bunch of fucking savages running around making making money, grabbing short money and just not, you know, they ain't about shit. You know, you bring a real power in there, you, you can knock these guys out of the box. So, you know, Haiti, in my view, they, they've just suffered too much from just poor, poor leadership. My God, the leadership there is just, you know, the way that the nation started. It could have been one of the greatest countries in all of the. Well, I understand why, you know, America couldn't have a, basically a West African country um, in the Caribbean like, like Haiti. Running well, syndicate after they tore them frogs out the frame. But, uh, you know, they didn't want to have black people running, running shit. But, uh, you know, they, 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 they could be a great nation because, you know, they, they, Haitians are, are great people. But yeah. they have, they have uh, I mean, terrible the leadership. Terrible yeah. leadership. Terrible. I, I mean, from the start, we, we, we got the, you know, we, we, got, we got fucked. Because um, after we got our independence, the United States basically, with the countries in Latin America, put an embargo on Haiti. Europe put an embargo on Haiti, so we didn't really trade it with no one. And sanctions. Yeah. And sanctions. 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 That's, that's on top really of that, we had to pay sanctions. for our independence to France. Uh, 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 yeah, it was uh, re- reparations. They had to pay for the reparations to the Yeah, to the reparations. Yeah, had to pay reparations to the that, That's what really hurt them, reparations to the France. So they tried to squeeze it out. They tried see, to squeeze it, the country out. Yeah. You could continue, Mike. No, no. I was just gonna. I was just gonna say we covered an article earlier um, to go on when you wasn't here uh, about uh, Macron, the French president, wanting to build an EU army, and you got support from the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Um, and, and if yeah, he, if, he, if, he he's kind of praising a little bit of the of Marshal Pétain and all that. Well, you know? Well, one of the things he said that was was significant was that what if we get into a conflict with the United States? Who's going to protect us, right? So if you're thinking that far ahead of time, and and I don't I don't I don't believe he's that um, intelligent, but I'm pretty sure he has people in his ear within the uh, French intelligence. If you're thinking that far ahead, your best bet to have a satellite state that's going to be strong, like Haiti, you can do for Haiti what Russia did for Syria. So why don't you go in there and actually restore uh, order in, in the way that's going to be beneficial for not just you, but for, for the Haitians too? But see, yeah. the Europeans are so racist that they have that, that it clouds their judgment and it doesn't allow them to make you know uh, um, you know uh, um, real consistent ideas that that are you know thoroughly uh, um, beneficial to the people on the ground. They're only cutting their own right. throats because at the end of the day, what's the, the you know. We know where the real, where the new action's going to be, and it ain't going to be in fucking Europe. So, um, you know, they 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 need to get up off of they need to get up off of that shit because them pale skins up in there getting ready to cut their own their own throats. I don't think uh, they, would, they would rather watch their countries and you know the EU burn than to ever do anything like that. They're not like the Russians. I I think earlier were you showing uh uh you know um. I guess white nationalists in America going to Eastern Europe and Russia to kind of uh, you know get training and support. I think that's mostly just so that the Russians can you know cause this uh, discontent and you know chaos in the United States. But yeah, yeah, they're not, yeah. They're not, they're not actually Russian. They're act, those guys are actually Ukrainian and Ukrainian. by uh, by blood, and they um they they don't like Russians at all. They're actually killing Russians. I mean, I mean, but they, they speak. But, 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 party. but most of them speak Russian, <laughs> right? But yeah, they, yeah, because they were part of the Soviet Union. They were part of the Soviet Union. But yeah. The war, the war that they're raging from the east of, of the Ukraine into the west, uh, of from the west into the east of the Ukraine through the Donbas and, and all those places um, in Donetsk. Uh, those 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 are that's the Russian speaking districts. But to the to the uh, to the west of Ukraine, those are actually uh, Ukrainians. And the Sloboda uh, Party, the Sloboda Party actually uses the same symbols as as the uh, Nazi as the Nazis. And if you uh, get a chance to watch that video any other time, uh, that's in the doc. That's in the docket. Um, it basically states that those those people who speak Russians will have to be killed off, and everybody else would have to remain. And that they this is far right nationalist movement. And that and I think what Macron is saying is that we have to protect ourselves. But you're seeing 
he's saying it from a political standpoint, but on the ground, people are saying this from a um, from from a uh, militia standpoint that we're going to do the same thing. So you're seeing in places like Greece and Italy and um, Spain where they're killing all these African migrants just because they're mig- just because they're black. You know, um, what happens when these guys take political power in places like Greece and um, in Italy and they decide that they they're going to take actions to their own hands? You may need an EU army to control Europe in itself or disintegrate. Right. Yeah, I, I yeah. guess the general uh, more. Uh, I guess maybe I was wrong, wrong, wrong about that one. Um, the the video, but there have been you know white nationalists who've gone to Russia to you know try to get this kind of training. Mm-hmm. But the general point is the Russians they're pro Russian more than they are I guess, um, you know, white nationalists or white supremacists at least in that sense they're able to put it aside. But a lot of the other well, well, well. I can tell you, they they do have a strong white nationalist movement there as well. Right, right. But I mean, they're on you know to a greater st- <clears throat> extent, they're able to put it aside for their country's interests, right? Uh, not so much in the rest of Europe, right? That's kind of how uh, you know they dis- disintegrated into World War One and World War Two, is because mm. of their nationalist tendencies are you know. At the same time, against others, but then not so much for themselves, right? Like, for example, Poland. Poland has a lot of white supremacists, but at the same time, they, you know, they support the Nazis, even though the Nazis hated the Poles and killed them, right? They, they, Russia doesn't necessarily have that kind of, uh, I guess, a psychosis to a certain extent. But the, I guess the general point I was making is France, countries like France and uh, even to a lesser extent Germany, They'd rather watch their countries burn than to make any kind of peace deal or uh, any strategic partnerships with their former colonies. And don't forget that Poland is a part of the EU as well. And if, if there's any clashes inside Poland, do you, do you think that the French and the Germans are going to come to the rescue of the Polish? I don't think so. No, they won't. <laughs> if the Poles knew their history, they, they would know better. They actually, the, Poland tried to get the United States to make a permanent uh, milita- forward military base in uh, Poland, but uh, Trump hasn't agreed to it. You know, he's trying to get them to pay mon- more money. Camp Trump. What was that, Mike? No, I said Camp Trump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's what they wanted to call it. Yeah, that's, that's the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> they they tr- pulled out all the stops, but, you know. Luckily, Trump didn't agree to it, but I think not so much for strategic reasons, but he's trying to get that money. We're an open mic right now, so it doesn't really matter what we're talking about. Um, what I find interesting is that Israel wants membership to the AU, right? But at the same time, they vetoed last week against Cuba in, in the blockade. Okay, so and, I- also, and also, what's up with Israel trying to deport and ship out all of the African immigrants that are in there working. What about that bullshit that they're pulling up in there? Oh, they gave them something called poison shots. Yeah, they man, they, man. Uh, Birth control for the women and actually sterilize the men, you know, kill, kill off all their sperm. But but it's also Netanyahu. was like, well, you guys got to get out by a good quite a period of time. If you don't, well, I'm going to th- throw you all in jail. I mean, these guys are fundamentally fucked up. You know, they're no, like a... Bees, they, 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 um, but here's the thing, though. Zionism is a fundamentally white supremacist ideology you know it's ethno-nationalist ideology what, what, what we don't care about jews from africa or jews from uh, palestinian jews or any other jews they have to be white european jews that's yeah, all yeah. They care about. yeah yeah but but you know but they're running that shit down then they want to come and become a part of basically the the, <laughs> the eu african union i mean these guys i mean they're like abused kids you know they got their asses torn out the frame in germany and they come back here trying to do this shit to others. I mean, I just, I just look at these guys as fucked up. I think they're fucked yeah. up. Yeah, if they were black, I, 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 if, they were, if they were black and they had a YouTube channel, they would have a uh, do rag on their head trying to battle. To- <laughs> 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 oh, fucking Mike, I, 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 I mute myself, man. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta mute myself. What are you gonna say, Instagram? Uh, you, you know, the most wild thing I saw is that you know. In Israel, these are people who are, you know, um, you know, children of the Holocaust, you know, to a certain extent, you know, a lot of them 
you know, their families migrated there, you know, after World War II. And then they went on to basically commit genocide. You know, there was a paper, you know, an article that came out in the Jerusalem Times a few years ago during, I think, was it the Third Intifada, where they basically openly advocated for genocide. They said it's morally and, you know, religiously correct thing to do as long, and a lot of their, uh, some of their politicians openly say it too. So really, they, they've shot themselves in the foot. You know, every, the rest of the world is turning away from them. This is their last dish effort, you know, in case the U.S., you know, they're trying to hedge their bets in case the U.S. doesn't continue to support them in the future. Well, they get strong. They will get stronger support by population, right? Because the United States only comprises of what three hundred million people, just roughly. Most of have, you know, a good portion of them are legal, legal citizens, so or legal residents, you should say. Um, but you compare it to Africa. Africa has a billion people, and it's going to grow in the next eight, you know, next sixty years up to two billion, um, if, if things go correctly. Um, right. So they're they're looking at you know where are we going to send all these where are we going to send all these Jews and where are we going to get our our, um, our support because there's no way any any um, Middle Eastern state would would uh, openly align themselves up with um, with Israel at 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 this current time. I mean, you see them in in Oman last week for the first time opening up uh, uh, um, relations with Oman, but even even that's risky. Um, yeah, under the table, Saudi Arabia and uh, Egypt are, you know, working with them, which I find, and Jordan, which, you know, is particularly, I find, disgusting, but. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, all, all these Muslim leaders are all promiscuous, you know, they all, they all enjoy a little, uh, <laughs> fall, fall, a little, little fellatio from with guys with little hats on their heads, so. Jeez. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> But I, I don't know. I think the general, you know, African people, they're they're not going to support Israel. Right? The government, they might find, you know, this and, you know, the corrupt politicians support, but not in the general people. I, I don't see that happening. Go ahead, Arzo. Yeah, so um, just like what you guys said, that this is probably Israel, like, hedging their bets. Um, they, they probably see long-term support from the u.s is probably not going to happen so they're looking for you know different options that's why they're trying to get close to china they're trying to get close to like india and they're probably looking at africa because everyone knows africa is the future and in that sense uh, I, I, did they really do need it because they're facing a demographic time bomb also i mean if you, you if you look at all the demographics for israel the next 60 to 70 years it's not going to look it's, it's going to look horrible because I think I think the Palestinians are going to outnumber them. I think I think Palestinians will be like seventy percent of the population in Israel, so Israel will no longer be a Jewish state. So I guess they're looking for so any support from anywhere as possible because at that point they're going to be an official apartheid. I mean they're already at an official apartheid state, but at that point there is going to be a, a minority basically oppressing the majority, and they're probably looking at. Africa, looking at China, looking at India, for someone who can replace that void that that will come once the U.S. withdraws their, their support, because they know it's going to happen. They, they 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 can feel the environment changing, that something is going to cut that relationship between the U.S. and Israel, because Israel is going to continue to do atrocities. Atrocity, so they they don't, they're, try, they're trying to hedge their bets. Right. They don't. They don't necessarily need the United States in that in that regard, um, because the resources are not in the United States; it's in Africa. And the the ability to have a continent the size of Africa um, to to your to your uh, benefit is um, something that the United States can't really um, provide for them. You know, it, I mean, no one. I mean, no one's going to invade Canada anytime soon. You don't have to worry about that. Like. Canada is not a place that's full of resources that everybody else is trying to get to. Um, the, the new play, the new gameplay for uh, next 100 years is Africa, and everybody knows that. And they can't get really, you know, they have a hard time getting support inside Asia um, because of all the things that they've done to the Palestinians. Because there's a lot of uh, Islamic, uh, not Islamic, but um, countries that uh, are part of the OIC, the uh, Organization of Islamic. Um, uh, uh, communities, I think that's what it's called, but um, it, 
you know, you have Indonesia, you have Malaysia, you have North Korea, who's not a Muslim state, but they're actually, um, they actually don't like doing business with, um, with Israel. You know, they don't find Israel as being a uh, friendly state. Um, same thing with China. China is not really a big fan of Israel. Um, we heard when the Philippine, the Filipino, um, president came to, um, Israel for the first time, he said that this is not a friendship, this is just a partnership. So they're openly, people are openly defying Israel left and right and, and basically telling them, you know, you know, where you can go and how far you can go with it. So that, that's, the, that, that's very interesting. And um, regarding to, because uh, anti-gravity, he, he, he mentioned like, why would Israel after the Holocaust being doing genocide. There was a great book I read called um, Fortress Israel. I would recommend that you guys to read it. It basically explains the Israeli mindset that they have a, a siege mentality on why they do the things they do. They really want, they, they, ultimately, they ultimately want secure borders and they'll do it at any cost, even if it is to invade countries. But at, that, at the same time, trying to get quote unquote secure borders, they've overreached plenty of times. I mean, uh, the 1980s, a Lebanese war, they, they, that was basically Israel's Vietnam. Um, they pissed off the region and trying to accumulate more territory to create a, a greater Israel, uh, a state. And even though they have ties with uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates against, against Iran, unofficially, they, they, these, those countries can't officially say they support Israel because they would piss off, it would piss off the Muslim world. But like you said, the Muslim world is still infuriated at Israel. So the Israeli mindset is, is, is geared on never again. And, and, and I've said this before, I wish black people kind of had that same mentality, like never again we'll, we'll be under the boot of a white supremacy that will learn from the mistakes of what made us be oppressed and try to be stronger. And instead of looking for equality, look for power. I wish that's one, yeah, that's one thing a uh, black people would, one mindset I wish black people worldwide would have is a siege mentality. But um, yeah, the, the Israeli mindset of getting secure borders at every cost has, yeah, they gotten some security, but it's cost them a lot, it cost them, a long-term insecurity, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll end the hangout. Yeah, so we'll end the hangout now. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, and the contest that we have for um, the Brain Trust logo is still in play. So if you know somebody who can create a logo, if you can create a logo, um, please submit it our way um, at the next Hangout. Uh, we definitely will compensate you for the work that you put in for this. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll see you on Friday for Economics, um, episode 93. All right. All right, later. Later. Later.